All right, it's 630. Call the meeting to order. <clears throat> Let the record show that all council members, all council members are present. Uh, like a motion for adoption of the agenda. Uh, less item 7B, which we'll have at the next meeting. So moved, Geringer. One one second. I've had a couple people ask if we can pull item 7C. I totally, just because the other item is going to take so long. So I said I would ask. Yeah, I think we should deal with that when we get to it, which okay. should be relatively quickly. Sounds great. Okay, but B, uh, just so you'll know, um, not available this evening, so we'll do it the next uh, next meeting. Okay, so we have a motion uh, from Councilmember Geringer, seconded by Councilmember Candell. Um, do the roll call vote. Councilmember Candell. Aye. Councilmember Geringer. Aye. Councilmember Kwok. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. <clears throat> and I'm an aye, so the agenda is adopted. Uh, we'll now go to public comments, and this is an opportunity for the public to comment on the item that's on our closed session. That is conference with real property negotiators, 3471 Mount Diablo Boulevard. Is there anyone who would like to address the council on this topic? I have one speaker, Mayor, and I will um, promote Elliot Hudson. Welcome, Mr. Hudson. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Indury. I'm not going to speak during the housing element agenda item. Others, including Colin Elliott and Rob LaVoy, have comments there I support, and I do not need to repeat. What I'm going to say concerns the failures of the city council and staff. I am heartbroken every time I drive through Lafayette and you watch yet another ugly, unimaginative, ordinary building that is contrary to everything your residents have asked you to do to preserve Lafayette's character. But all of that compares to what is coming. You will be forever known to anyone who has paid attention as the council and staff that oversaw the forever destruction of the downtown Lafayette we have loved for so long. There is no opportunity to preserve Lafayette's council concerning the element, housing element that this council has ignored. You have BART-based BART lot based arguments you can present to HCD to limit the massive number of units required in Lafayette that you have totally ignored and not even had the courage or imagination to present. You have alternatives to minimize the massive and destructive upzoning of our downtown that you have ignored. You've continued to rely on a city attorney who shares personal responsibility for the decade long debacle of the terraces and for court confirmed violations of the Brown Act and you who have been asked to replace. You've continued to follow staff recommendations and a grade C student in urban planning would advocate. You've been begged to limit the monstrously excessive buffer advocated by your subpar staff and you have ignored that. You have been told for months and have seen that staff failed to offer any objective architectural standards that might preserve a modicum of our town's character. And you have begged, you've been begged to direct writing of such standards and you've done nothing. This council is destroying the town I have loved. I am disappointed, bitter and disgusted. Your residents will be too once they realize the full impact of the opportunities you have failed to even to attempt to pursue and as the Lafayette downtown they have loved ceases to exist. That is the legacy of this council. Whereas Lafayette has been extraordinary, this council will leave a legacy of ordinary mediocrity and failures. You've had residents who have devoted hundreds of hours trying to steer in a better path and they have been ignored every single time. Concerning the housing element and the character of Lafayette, this council will have accomplished nothing. 
and I am truly heartbroken at what is coming for our town. Thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker? I see none. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else who'd like to address the council? We are technically uh, taking comments on the item that's on the closed session. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council? I see no further hands raised. Okay, we will move over to the closed session and then we'll return to the regular session at 7 p.m. So I'll see you in the closed session. <clears throat>
The Lafayette City Council is currently in closed session. Open session is scheduled to begin at 7 p.m.
Okay, it's 7.01. Council is back in public session. Just concluded our closed session and determined to put on the agenda of a special meeting to begin at 7 p.m. on Monday, January 30th, a consideration of whether or not to exercise our option to purchase the property at 3471 Mount Diablo Boulevard, which currently houses our police department. So that will be considered January 30th at a special meeting. Uh, Mayor, I, I give me a moment to um, see if we can find uh, Council Member Dawson. Oh, here she is. She's coming your way now. And the meeting on the 30th, you said was going to start at what time? 7 p.m. Thank you very much. All right, we're on to item six, public comments. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on an item on matters that are not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone who would like to spend three minutes uh, addressing the council? Henry Simon is uh, asking to speak, so I'm bringing him over now. Good evening, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Henry Simons, and I'm BART's Government and Community Relations Representative for Contra Costa County. I've had the chance to meet some of you in person, and I'm looking forward to meeting the rest of you when I have a chance. I'm speaking tonight because BART has a major construction project coming up over President's Day weekend that will impact Lafayette residents. Um, we're replacing 2,400 feet of rail between Arinda and Lafayette stations and working on many maintenance projects in the Berkeley Hills Tunnel. Um, so this work will occur 24 hours a day and will involve <clears throat> lights and backup alarms to keep our workers safe. And over the weekend, BART will operate a bus bridge between Rock Ridge, Orinda, and Lafayette stations. Uh, while the bus bridge is in progress, our riders should expect a 30 minute delay. Um, to inform the public about this project, we sent a mailer to all Lafayette residents within a quarter mile of the BART trackway, letting them know about the work and providing an email address and phone number they can contact over the weekend if construction is particularly disruptive. Uh, I sent you an email, uh, the council and the city manager, an email last week with <clears throat> all the details about the project, which has my contact in it, information in it. So if any of you have any questions, please feel free to ask your questions now or give me a call or send me an email. Uh, we'd also be happy to arrange a briefing with you uh, with BART's construction staff <clears throat> who will be managing the work and a BART director if you are interested. Uh, thanks so much for your time and have a great evening. Hey, Mr. Simons, thank you very much for coming to us and letting us know and the public know about that. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Simons at this point? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks so much, everyone. Good night. City Clerk Robbins, is there anyone else who would like to address the council on a matter not on tonight's agenda? No additional hands raised, Mayor. Okay, thank you. All right, we're on to item 7A. I'll call on Tracy Robinson, our Administrative Services Director. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Jerry, members of the council. Um, we have two new staff members that we would like to introduce you to. So hopefully they will be coming in in a moment. We're very excited to have um, these folks on board, both members of the planning department. And I'm going to wait. Okay. I see Sonia. Coming in. There is Sonia. So I would like to introduce you to Sonia Urzoa. 
<laughs> Sorry, Urzua, she can tell you. Um, Sonia is our new assistant planning director. And Sonia is initially uh, from Los Angeles. Um, and she and her family now live in the city of Alameda. So after attending Cal, go Bears, uh, she returned to Southern California to get her master's in urban planning. Then she continued to the University of Wisconsin at Madison for her law degree. And she says to look for the cheese heads once our office remodel is completed. And Sonia comes to us with 20 years of planning experience working for Alameda County. So welcome, Sonia. Thank you. It's so nice to meet everyone on this council. I'm really looking forward to getting to know everyone and hopefully meeting you in person uh, sometime very soon. Um, everyone at the staff at City of Lafayette has been very gracious and welcoming, so I really appreciate everyone's attention. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Great to have you with us. And our next staff member is Arlie Cassidy. Arlie is joining us as a senior planner. Arlie grew up in the East Bay and loves living here. Um, she has come to Lafayette from the uh, private sector from Urban Planning Partners. Um, she previously worked for the town of Portola Valley and the city of Emeryville. Uh, she says her favorite projects including revamping ADU ordinance, planning a pedestrian bike trail connection through three jurisdictions and helping to develop an entirely new zoning code. Um, she's also worked as a travel guide, a policy manager, and in the MIT libraries. So she and her husband and dog love to go for hikes around the Bay Area. She likes to camp and backpack, plan trips, and explore new places, read, cook, and play board games. And we're especially looking forward to getting our um, staff board game, monthly board games back and really Arlie says she has a lot of fun things we can add to our repertoire. So we're very excited oh. to have her on board. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here. It's wonderful to meet you, hopefully in person soon. Um, I, I can only echo Sonia's sentiment. It's been such a lovely time having such a warm welcome from staff. Um, I really look forward to working with and for you, the city council and the citizens of Lafayette. So thank you. Hey, well, welcome. Welcome. We're so happy to have you as our planning department is as well. <laughs> Any other? Teresa, uh, Councilmember Garinger. May I ask, um, Sonia, um, Tracy had said um, that you could share the pronunciation of your name. So we start off on a, on a good foot. And, and I'm oh, sure yeah. Tracy was practically perfect, but. It was really close. It's really close. Um, my last name is spelled in English. Is and you pronounce it Urzua. In Spanish, you would pronounce it Ursua. So it's hard. There's a lot of vowels and then a Z in there. It's not easy, but um, yes. Either way, really, really great job, Tracy. Thank you and, and welcome to both of you. As Gina said, very excited. And I know the planning department is um, glad to have you there as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you again. Okay, so we're on to item, we uh, deferred item 7B until uh, February. So we're on to item 7Z. Now, C, uh, uh, Councilmember uh, um, Kendall asked that we consider moving this. Let me, um, let's see, is Patrick coming on? Well, let me ask, uh, we have Patrick and we also have a representative from CCTA, Mayor, waiting to come on. And the PlaceWorks consultants. Looks like a whole team. Yes. So, so we have everybody here. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to bring Patrick in? Uh, yes, please. I shall do it. And David early just raised his hand, so I imagine. He oh, okay. So, Councilmember Kendall, would you still like to consider? No, that's okay. Okay. Patrick should be coming in now. He's not responding, so he may be away from his computer for the month. Right. 
I can bring in our two CCTA reps, David Early. Rena Wilson. Both coming in now. Good evening. Um, I'll start speaking on behalf of our team. Um, I didn't quite, I'm David Early with PlaceWorks and I'll be making the presentation. Um, normally, we would have either Matt Kelly or John Huang, and of course, I can't see the waiting room or anything. I don't know if one of them is here to make a few brief remarks. Um, yeah. If they are here, we should let them in first, and they, one of them will speak, and then I will make the presentation. Matt Kelly's coming in. Okay, Mr. Kelly, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Anduri, um, and good to be here, council members. Uh, Matt Kelly, Senior Transportation Planner with CCTA. I know uh, David was starting to present there, but I'll just kick things off real quick. I know you got a, a lot of things on your agenda tonight, but I I'm, I'm represent the, Con the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. We are a sales tax authority and congestion management agency for Contra Costa. A half cent of every dollar you spend in, in uh, Contra Costa goes towards Measure J, and Measure J goes towards uh, local and regional transportation uh, improvements, projects, and programs. Part of Measure J is the Growth Management Program, uh, which is a unique um, feature to, uh, to Contra Costa County. And uh, one of the main uh, uh, mechanisms for implementing the Growth Management Program is our action plans for routes of regional significance. There are five action plans around the county. Tonight, we are focused on the La Mirinda action plan, of which uh, Lafayette, Arinda, and Moraga are the, uh, are the partners that put together the plan. Um, so it is a, a, a communal plan. It's not uh, three cities plans it, uh, you know, stitched together. It's really a plan for for what we call the sub area or the planning area. Um, we have five of these areas around the county that are kind of unique uh, central county, unique amongst themselves and that they have you know similar characteristics and transportation uh, facilities in common. So uh, we prepare plans at each of those uh, geographies and um, uh, and then they're approved at that level. There's a, 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 a a policy body called the La Mirinda uh, Project Management Committee or Program Management Committee, and they uh, are the ones who um, approve this plan. But it is made up of of, uh, of members who are in this room, amongst uh, others from the other two jurisdictions. So I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to let uh, David Early, who leads our consultant team, who's been actually helping all of the sub areas around the county, all five of them put together their action plans. Um, he's gonna describe the work we've done here in La Mirinda and uh, allow for uh, some uh, feedback if, if uh, any of the council members or the, or the public have any uh, comments. So I'm gonna turn it over to David and, and thank you uh, council members for your time tonight. Great, thank you very much, Matt. I'm David Early and I'm a principal at PlaceWorks. I'm the principal in charge of our efforts for CCTA, which as Matt just told you, encompass not only the La Mirinda area, but the other five sub areas of the county as well. I'm joined here this evening by Tarina Wilson from my office, who is our project manager. And honestly, she's done most of the work, um, but um, she's, she's done an, an excellent job on all of this work um, all throughout the county. And I really wanna thank her for all of that. I think some of you may have not seen our presentations in the past, um, just because of changes on the council and whatnot. I do want to warn you that this is a big alphabet soup and a lot of complicated information, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, let me say that although I will go through a lot of information, um, no question is a dumb question. Afterwards, if you have questions that might seem very basic to you, go ahead and ask, and Matt and Tareen and I will all be happy to answer them. Um, with that said, I'm going to share my screen and show you um, my presentation. 
and I'm going to um, give you an overview of both the action plan itself, which is the document that we're presenting to you this evening, as well as um, a more general background about some of the information that Matt already gave you. So I'm just gonna dive in and I would ask you to save your questions. Please make note of any questions. I can go back to individual slides if you have questions um, once my presentation is done. And I am going to be giving you a little bit of an overview of the Measure J Growth Management Program. I'm going to talk about this project for updating the action plans and the CTP, um, the countywide transportation plan. See, there we go with the alphabet soup already. Um, I'll talk about both the action plans and the countywide transportation plan. And then I will give you an overview of the public outreach that we've already completed here in La Mirinda and talk about next steps. So um, many of you are familiar with Measure J and Matt talk, just did talk about it that um, Measure J is the measure that most recently reestablished the half cent sales tax that's been in place in Contra Costa um, for over 20 years. Um, it funds a series of projects and programs um, that are outlined in local transportation documents. And those fundamental planning documents are the countywide transportation plan, which um, among other things has as uh, subservient parts of it, these five action plans that I'm going to be talking about this evening. Um, Measure J also establishes the county's growth management program, which all jurisdictions within the county need to participate in um, and have an urban growth boundary in order to um, receive those Measure J funds. And um, as since you do comply, as do all the jurisdictions in the county with the GMP, the growth management program, you are require, um, you are entitled to um, what are called return to source funds or local streets and roads funds, which make up 18% of Measure J revenues and are returned to each jurisdiction um, based on a formula. So um, that's one of the places that these funds are used. So Measure J does set up forward a growth management program that does include a requirement for a voter improved urban limit line. You see here on this map, the incorporated cities, um, which are all entirely within urban, not within the urban limit line, as well as some portions of the unincorporated county that are also within that line. And you can see a large segment of the county that is not within that line and that therefore is precluded from urbanization, um, which is a very important planning principle within the county. Uh, Measure J also seeks to focus new development away from green fields, preserving valuable lands, um, particularly agriculture lands. It's intended to concentrate development into urban areas, thereby reducing the need for new infrastructure, such as roads, sewers, and utilities. So the action plans, as Matt already mentioned, are required by Measure J and the Growth Management Program as implementation tools. There are a total of five of them, as you see in this map. It gets extra confusing because um, two of these five areas are within the same uh, official planning areas, and you are in that in one of those two. So you, together with what the Tri Valley, are in a single area that's called the Southwest area. Um, you, um, your LPMC meets to discuss issues in La Marinda. A separate group, the Tri-Valley Transportation Committee, meets to discuss issues in the Tri-Valley. And then you have a further board, which um, Teresa Geringer sits on, which is called the Southwest Area Transportation Committee. And it oversees the work of both La Marinda's LPMC, as well as Tri-Valley's TVTC. I'm sorry for all of this. Um, there are three other RTPCs, each of which oversee just one area. West County has what's called WICTAC, the West County Transportation Advisory Committee. Central County has TransPAC, um, and East County has TransPlan. So a total of five areas with four RTPCs, but your RTPC, known as SWAT, also has that subcommittee of the LPMC. Each of the action plans that um, for these areas that you see shown here has goals, objectives, and performance measures regarding major arterials, transit lines, and active transportation routes, particularly trails. The action plans require new developments to mitigate negative impacts to these routes through what are currently called multimodal transportation service objectives, or MTSOs, and which in this new plan are being changed in name to regional transportation objectives, or RTOs. 
Um, the action plans also do list projects and programs that are intended to help all of you as local jurisdictions to meet the MTSOs or now RTOs. The action plans require you to work with your neighboring jurisdictions to cooperatively work together when planning for growth and thereby to protect communities from downstream impacts of development that might occur in another city. And I do want to let you know, in case you're not aware of this, that that it's you know I'm a consultant who works all over the state, and it really is my honest opinion that Contra Costa County has one of the most advanced and sophisticated transportation planning mechanisms in place of any county in the state. Um, you do require of yourselves that you work together through regional planning, through Measure J, the Growth Management Program, the Action Plans, and ultimately the CTP to ensure that planning for transportation really is interjurisdictional and cooperative and goes across county lines because, of course, traffic goes across city boundaries. So you need this regional planning system in place, and it's a very it's a very good system that's really made a big difference over these last years that it's been in place. So then the, the countywide transportation plan is the document that will roll up all of these five action plans into a single countywide document and provide overall direction for achieving and maintaining a balanced and functional transportation system within the county. It's the document that outlines CCTA's overall vision for future transportation. It establishes goals, strategies, projects, and actions for achieving that vision, and then directs transportation funding to be allocated throughout the county. Some key accomplishments that have happened under past um, action plans and the past CTPs include the Caldecott Tunnels fourth bore, which of course has been very important to the La Morinda area, the resurfacing of Moraga Way for vehicles and restriping it with a buffered class two bike lane, the La Morinda school bus program, the livable Moraga Way program, um, Canyon Road bridge improvements to enhance emergency evacuation out of the Moraga area, as well as a number of countywide programs that you see here, including establishment of the Gomentum Autonomous Vehicle Testing Facility at the Concord Naval Weapons Station, um, local street and maintenance funds that come to you as a city, um, charge up Contra Costa, which is helping to deploy electrical vehicle and electric vehicle charging throughout the county, a number of BART parking and access improvements. You heard about some of the BART maintenance happening already. BART um, CCTA has helped to fund not necessarily that project, but other improvements at BART stations um, throughout um, Contra Costa County and transportation for livable communities grants, which I know have been used in all three of the cities in the La Marinda area to do downtown planning and other types of planning projects. Um, here's an overview of where we're headed with this project. We started at the end of 2021 and worked all through 2022 to get where we are today with the action plans that are almost complete. We are now just beginning the countywide transportation plan process, and that will take roughly another year, culminating at um, probably in early 2024. Uh, Tim Hale, the executive director at CCTA, has said that this really is a chance to establish big, bold, new ideas to enhance the county's transportation network. And he has really encouraged us to make sure that we really do have a whole new set of parameters, new emphases, and you see some of them listed here. Um, first, our vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, and particularly reducing VMT, so people are driving in their individual cars less. And the way we can achieve that, among other things, is through multimodal transportation, making a better network of transit, a better BART network, a better network for bikes and pedestrians, not to mention, of course, land use decisions that help to bring people within walking distance of some of their destinations and day-to-day -day activities. So VMT reduction, multimodal transportation, an emphasis on safety on the roadway network, as well as climate change, these are all new emphases. And we are building on some of the themes that have already been developed through um, past work on the 2020 transportation expenditure plan, which include innovation and technology, a holistic multimodal approach, and an integrated approach to corridor management, such as the Highway 24 and I-680 corridors. So these are some of the basic principles that we're trying to wrap into all of the work that we're doing. Um, now we do have an action plan that's virtually complete and it has been published by your staff onto the city's website. 
Um, we're here really as a courtesy to you. And honestly, this is the only city where we're making an individual presentation anywhere in the county, but your staff did request that. And so we we actually made one already to you and we're making the second one as a courtesy based on your staff request. Um, and we are um, creating these action plans and all five of them are virtually done um, to do the things you see listed here, addressing today's transportation issues, establishing quantitative service objectives, which are in the regional transportation objectives, identifying regional routes of significance for all three modes, roadways, transit, and active transportation, providing growth management compliance metrics, and expanding those MTSOs to become regional transportation objectives that you see covering all seven items that are here, um, roadways, transit, active transportation, safety, climate change, and innovation and technology. Um, we are looking at equity also in other parts of the county, particularly those that have what are called equity priority communities. Those equity priority communities, which tend to be lower income, do not exist in the La Mirinda area. So the La Mirinda action plan does not have an equity section, but three of the other four action plans do have that section to address the equity issues in those communities. So that gives you an overview of these action plans. Um, this is a summary of the table of contents. You can see that there are 12 chapters along with five appendices, and they do give an introduction, cover current conditions, set out vision goals and policies, and then they identify those routes of regional significance for all three, all modes. And then there are a total of, of six chapters that look at those individual subjects that I showed on the last slide, transit, active transportation, roadways, safety, climate change, and innovation and technology. The plan concludes with a chapter on the financial outlook and financing of improvements, and also has a chapter on procedures for notification, review, and monitoring to comply with the Measure J Growth Management Plan requirements. I, I wanna mention a little bit about routes of regional significance, which you may have heard about already. Um, these are routes, um, whether roadways, transit routes, or active transportation facilities that interconnect the subregions in the county, interconnect from one city to another, and in many cases, even cross county lines. So we've identified them based on the criteria that you see on this little chart. Um, all routes of regional significance are required to be those where your sub area, in this case, you as La Mirinda, Lafayette together with Moraga and Orinda, where you all agree that you want to share regional responsibility for level of service and um, serve an overall facility on these routes. In addition to that, that sub area interest, they have to meet at least one of the other criteria that you see listed here. They have to either connect two or more sub areas within the county. So for example, going out to on Pleasant Hill Road into Walnut Creek or Highway 24 going from Alameda County into um, the rest of the county. They may cross county boundaries as does Highway 24 going through the Caldecott Tunnel. They may carry significant through traffic or they may provide access to a regional center, a regional highway or a transit facility such as your downtown and downtown Lafayette. So those are the requirements to become a route of regional significance. Um, and those are then mapped on maps very like this one. And this is a map that shows them countywide. Um, and then I do have a map here that shows them just in La Mirinda area. This is a zoom in of the previous map. And you can see on this map that there are five different colors for these corridors that indicate rail, bus, freeway, surface streets, and bike and pedestrian routes. Um, we show the existing BART stations. And these are maps that show um, these major corridors that are moving traffic through the, the subregion and connecting out to other parts of the county and into Alameda County as well. Um, those are shown in chapter four of the action plan. And then um, chapters five through 10 are the chapters that have the regional transportation objectives in them. And I'm not going to read all these individually. I think you have had a chance if you wanted to, to look at them online, but you can see here that we have five RTOs regarding transit. We have three regarding active transportation. We have four regarding roadways, two of which relate to the freeways, particularly to Highway 24, and two of which relate to um, surface roadways, such as Mount Diablo Boulevard and Pleasant Hill Road. In addition to that, we have RTOs regarding safety, three of them, um, five regarding climate change, and one regarding innovation and technology. And I'll be happy to answer questions that any of you may have about any of those um, once I'm finished with my presentation. Um, similarly, 
There is a whole host of actions within the action plan. Um, there are 21 actions regarding transit. And of course, that's the highest number, as you can see, representing the importance of transit within this action plan. We also have 18 actions regarding active transportation for bikes and pedestrians. We have 18 actions regarding roadways and vehicles. We have nine regarding safety, six in regard to climate change, nine in regard to innovation and technology, and one in regard to finance. So it's a very comprehensive plan with a lot of actions in it. And then um, responsibility for each of these actions is assigned to one or more agencies. And that is found in Appendix B of the document. Um, I did want to mention a little bit about the process that we have been engaged in. Um, we have had a large number of meetings already, going back all the way to November of 2021. We've met with the Technical Advisory Committee of LPMC a total of eight times that you see listed at the top of the left-hand part of the slide. Um, there have been um, additional, there was uh, um, additional meetings um, with the SWAT committee in January. There will be um, of 2022 in April and we'll be having one um, in March as well. Um, the SWAT Technical Advisory Committee will be, has also met about this. The SWAT committee itself is meeting on January, uh, met on um, January 18th as well. Um, and we're having additional meetings um, with your city council, as I already mentioned, with your transportation and circulation commission, and then tonight's council meeting. In addition to that, we've done quite a bit of public outreach um, and actually more public outreach in the La Mirinda area than the other parts of the county. Um, we've conducted two separate online surveys. In spring of 2022, we held two um, in-person events at both the, Laf the Lafayette BART station, as well as the Arinda Farmers Market, and we conducted an online public workshop as well. Um, we had two additional pop-up events uh, at um, the, in Moraga and the Arinda Farmers Market in November of this year, and we've conducted ongoing engagement with meetings every two months with a group of community-based organizations that represent a variety of points of view throughout the county, including, for example, Save Mount Diablo and the East Bay Leadership Council, just to name two of about 15 different organizations that have been attending those meetings. So you can see from this that there's been very extensive outreach, um, coordination with your technical advisory committee, outreach to your um, LPMC committee, um, to your own city council, and to the public at large. I did want to mention very quickly a little bit about questions that have come up about how this planning relates to overall growth policy and the new housing and safety elements. I know your community is currently preparing a housing element, and we'll even be looking at that this evening. Um, it is important to understand that although this process is happening pretty much at the same time, and they do the action plans in the CTP do account for the growth foreseen in the housing elements. Um, they are not housing documents. So this is a transportation planning document. And if anything, it's important to understand that first off that the horizon year is very different. Your housing element is only for an eight year planning period. The action plan has a horizon all the way through 2050. So about 27 years. So it's a very different planning horizon. And it's also the case, as I'm sure many of you know, that state law has changed over the last several years so that um, we no longer look for issues about level of service or traffic capacity when we do an environmental impact report or another analysis under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, what we look at instead is whether VMT will be reduced. And as long as VMT is not exacerbated, um, then on the transportation side, there's no significant um, impact found in transportation issues. So in that sense, a lack of roadway capacity is no longer a reason to disapprove a residential project that might be foreseen in your housing element. Um, so I just wanted to go over those issues just in case those questions existed for you. Um, I want to wrap up just by talking about our process, both moving forward and this evening. I have two last slides here. Um, first, I want to show you these steps of the process. Um, you will notice that the Lafayette City Council is not mentioned on this slide. That's because of what Matt said, that this really is a document that belongs to the LPMC and to SWAT. And we're here for, with you as a courtesy to take your comments for those to be moved back to LPMC to give us their feedback. So we have met with the LPMC TAC as well as the SWAT TAC last week. 
Um, the LPMC TAC asked for an additional meeting on February 15th to wrap up this document. And so any comments that you make tonight will go through your staff back to the LPMC Technical Advisory Committee on February 15th. Um, once that's completed, we will publish a formal public review document as the draft action plan, and that will come forward to your um, LPMC and SWAT policy boards that will both have meetings back to back on March 6th, hopefully to approve those documents that have come out of your technical advisory committee, and then in step four to move them forward to um, CCTA. CCTA will meet in, in April, first its planning committee in the first part of April, and then the CCTA authority board in the middle of the month. And at that time, we expect that the um, CCTA will formally accept all five of the action plans. Then things kind of slow down a little from the public process um, while we prepare the draft CTP. And that will include all five action plans, as you see here on this slide and under point five. And there will be a formal public review and adoption process with public input that will occur in late 2023 and early 2024. And once that's happened and the CTP has been adopted, then the five action plans will come back to the five policy boards for formal adoption after the CTP is already in place. So the action, the, the input you give tonight, again, will go through the LPMC TAC, ultimately to the LPMC and SWAT committees, and then become input to these draft action plans. So just to wrap up, tonight's process is that we encourage you to take public comment if you like and to make comments of your own. Um, City of Lafayette staff, of course, are here and will report any comments made to the LPMC Technical Advisory Committee as they see appropriate, and the LPMC TAC will direct changes to that draft plan. The draft plan will then be presented to both the LPMC and SWAT policy boards at those meetings in March for approval and forwarding to CCTA for inclusion in the CTP. That ends my presentation and all my many acronyms. I will stop the share of the compute of the screen um, and open it up to any questions or comments that you all may have. And of course, I'm available to answer those questions, as is Matt and Tarina, and we can put the slides back up if you would like them. Okay, thank you very much for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. I think what way we'll, we'll proceed is I'll ask if any council members have questions and we'll just do questions and then we'll open to the public for comments and then come back to the council for comments. So does any council member have a, a question for Mr. Early, Mr. Kelly, or Ms. Wilson? Okay, oh, council member Candell. Sure, um, um, we have, thank you guys. And thank you, the last meeting we had, there was a bunch of small little edits and changes to figures that were done. And it, it looks, thank you very much for all of that. Appreciate that. Um, the, uh, there is a question about um, the LOS, the loss of service, level of service, um, being dropped from Pleasant Hill Road and also maybe from Moraga Road, Mount Diablo intersections. Can you explain if that's, has, has that actually been dropped and do we not have a support or level of service there at all anymore? Right. So first we should define the term dropped because it could mean either of two things. Um, one is that it was uh, it has been removed and the other would be that it has been lowered. Um, so um, and the answer to that question is actually different for the two locations you mentioned. Um, your current action plan um, does has side street level of service, but does not have a, a fundamental level of service anywhere except along Pleasant Hill Road. Um, we are actually adding a level of service standard along the routes of regional significance throughout the La Mirinda area. So in that case, it's not a removal, but actually an addition. Um, but we have also found through our modeling that level of service is lower than the standard has been for the um, Pleasant Hill Road corridor. So our calculations show that actually in the AM and PM peak hours, before the pandemic, which is all we have to work from, LOS level of service along Pleasant Hill Road and particularly at um, Deer Hill Road was, was ha, is and has been and in the future will be LOSF. 
Um, and it happens that that is near the high school, but that's not from what we can tell the major reason. Certainly the school has some impact there, um, but it's primarily from through traffic serving both Lafayette and the surrounding communities. And we do show an LOS level of service of F in both the morning and AM um, evening peak hours. Um, we do not believe that it's possible to do uh, additional intersection improvements to those areas, um, even if there were a will to do so. Of course, through the terraces project, you all have just recently approved a possible additional turning lane or, or trap lane as it's called along that roadway, but your gateway constraints policy, which is also in the action plan and which we're keeping, um, actually precludes additional capacity improvements and which we don't think are probably possible physically anyway. So for all of those reasons, it is true that we are proposing to lower the standard along Pleasant Hill Road to, um, or at that particular intersection, not the whole roadway, but at that particular intersection, um, we are showing no level of service standard there, um, even though in the past you've tried to maintain D because we don't think it's feasible and we don't think you should have a plan in place that we all, that we believe at least from a technical perspective cannot be fulfilled. So, um, but we are, for example, adding requirements for level of service on major roadways, um, including Mount Diablo Boulevard, Mount Diablo Road, um, and um, Moraga Way, Moraga Road, and um, other locations. We do have lower standards or no standard in a few areas where we feel they can't be achieved. And those include the downtowns, which already have lower levels of service, freeway on ramps, and areas immediately around public schools. Okay, a couple of questions, <laughs> thank you. Um, so is there a way, or I, I know we can't add capacity to Pleasant Hill Road, that you've made that clear, or at least it's not reasonable in this plan, um, but we could say it can't get worse or can't get significantly worse or something like that. And so what was the justification to just, to, I know, because we have a current comparison. Could we, if we so wanted, or could you add something that says, it shouldn't get any worse. We know it's bad. It can't get worse. Well, certainly you can make that comment and suggest it to the LPMC TAC and try and move it forward. I do have some concerns about that because, um, you know, we can, you can calculate, uh, let, me, let me try and slow down. You, level of service is expressed with, the, expressed with these letter grades that go from A through F and F is below I, I forget the number. I think it's one, it's a it's one or greater is the the volume to capacity. I believe, um, and we can so you can't get worse than F, but you can have a worse or worse number. So you could you could calculate that volume to capacity ratio and say that you don't want it to slip below what it is today. The problem with that again is that you can't necessarily control the numbers of residential units being built, the number of jobs being created. Um, particularly residential units given state housing mandates. Some of those are in your community, some of them are elsewhere. And again, we don't necessarily have a way to enhance capacity in the roadway. So if you're going to see continue increases in volume and no increase in capacity, then even if your goal or objective were to maintain the volume to capacity ratio that exists today, the simple math is that if, if volumes increase and capacity does not increase, that ratio may get worse and we really can't control that. So that's why, again, we've suggested really no standard. You could try and say, we don't want it to get worse than it is today, but I'm frankly not sure how you would actually ensure that you'd achieve that. Okay. Um, then next one, we also, what do you define as downtown? Because like Mount Abel Boulevard is now a, a route of regional significance. And you're saying that you added levels of service on that, but nothing in the downtown, but it's all in the downtown. So what do you define as downtown? So each of your communities has its own definition of the downtown. I would defer to your staff to say exactly how you define the downtown, but it is, it's the area as defined by each of the three jurisdictions. Is Patrick here? Yeah, Patrick and Mike are here. We can. Yeah. I am here, and um, I would just have to confer with Mike to see what traditionally has been, or in the downtown um, specific plan, 
what uh, the definition is for for downtown. Um, sure. But certainly, I can I can dig that up and and work with um, PlaceWorks and CCTA in defining that. Cool. Thank you. Um, so that's enough for that. I remember the one is um, we had an earlier draft of this plan back in October. Um, we had two more goals than we have now. And one of them I, I understand, but the second one was goal nine. And it said minimize congestion and improve mobility on routes of, routes of significance within La Mirinda. And that has been removed. Is there an explanation or? Yes, I, this is a thing that we've talked about at some length. Um, and I think Torina probably remembers it better than I do. Um, there were some comments that asked that it be removed. And Torina, can you just jump in here and remind us of exactly when that happened? Yeah, that came from a City of Lafayette letter um, that was submitted by staff and the, um, the LPMC TAC. And when we met with the LPMC TAC last week on the 18th, we had had a request to add that goal back in to not have it removed. And so Patrick is um, working on looking into why the request was made and whether or not we should add it back in. So that is a comment that Patrick is already considering and we'll talk about at the February 15th meeting. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. All right, that, that's it for me. Okay, any other questions from council members? Seeing none, uh, we'll open it to the public and public comments and questions. Mayor, we have two uh, speakers, Mike McClure and Stella Witherspoon. Mike is coming into your meeting now. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. McClure. Very good, thank you. Welcome. Mike, thank Welcome you from much. Moraga. Yes, Mike McClure from Moraga here. First, I wanna, I wanna thank CCTA and the LMPC for all the work you've done in this draft of the La Mirinda Action Plan. I see many really good ideas that I like. So there's just a couple of points I wanna make and, and questions that go with that. First is traffic congestion from Moraga to Arinda and Lafayette via Moraga Road and Moraga Way is heavily congested as we speak today. All three cities have goals to add thousands of residential units required by the state with thousands of additional people and thousands of cars. The only bus service in Moraga is a county connection service which runs every 30 minutes, which really doesn't attract people to it. As congestion will worsen without significant steps and examining best ideas, the best idea I've heard over the years is shuttles, and I haven't really seen a lot of progress on that. Uh, I talked to, to Matt Kelly. Thank you, Matt, for spending time with me. And he mentioned the Delta Transit program of Try My Ride, a shuttle demand-based system with an app where you take your phone and you say where you want to go, and you can schedule your trip. $2 a person. You only need two people with 15-minute intervals. I think ideas like that are great. It's successful and they're expanding. He also mentioned the pilot program at Rossmore with an all electric uh, shuttle demand based system. So my first question is, I do see references in the document, some general and indirect perhaps, but a specific reference in Appendix B. Can you confirm that a program, a shuttle program like this will be an objective for La Mirinda with a review analysis and a draft shuttle plan prepared for uh, La Mirinda as a top priority. My second item comes from the November 17th meeting, which um, CCT, I believe, uh, presented. Uh, David was there hosting it. Uh, a person at that meeting had made a request that the St. Mary's Road that goes to Olympic and Pleasant Hill Road become a route of regional significance. And I thought that was a really good idea due to the enhanced or increased traffic that's been seen. For context, there's a significant issue of cut through traffic coming over the Oakland Hills, goes through the local areas of Moraga and the local neighborhoods of uh, Lafayette that then pours out into Olympic and Pleasant Hill Road. I've personally done that commute and you can save 20 to 30 minutes of time by going over the hill. 
Um, those people tend to commute to Danville, Walnut Creek, Pleasant Hill, and Concord, substantial population areas. So my second question is, has the CCTA and LMPC discussed making this route uh, a route of regional significance? And if you have not had that discussion, is that something you could discuss? Thank you. Okay, I think we'll um, normally wait to, for questions to be answered at the end, but since we have our guests here, um, Mr. Kelly and Mr. Early, would you like to respond to that? Matt, do you want me to take it or you want to go? Well, uh, David could probably sum it. I, I think, you know, I, I actually, Tarina is probably the best at, at what language is in the plan, but I do think we have language in there about uh, running smaller shuttles on demand service under our innovation section or transit section. I'm not sure, but I think Trina probably does have it right in front of her. You want to go ahead and let her speak? Yes, to it's uh, innovation and technology dash two, which is in chapter 10. And it's about um, seeking implementation of new technology in terms of autonomous buses and shuttles. And, you know, you. You, 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 this, you know, La Miranda is free to, you know, fine tune that language or, or add something, you know, build off of the, the pilot being done at Rossmore or something like that, if you want to make it more direct. But we think that, you know, th these things are constantly evolving, whether they're all electric, whether they're hydrogen, whether they're fully automated, partially automated. So we don't want to be tied into a, a particular technology, but we want to have the flexibility to be able to run what's ever most appropriate in, in the, you know, the community. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's the first of the two questions. In terms of the second question about Canyon Road, um, Councilmember McClure, we did have extensive discussions about that at both the um, LPMC committee level, policy board level, and also the TAC level. And although I know there are a number of commuters who go back and forth over that hill, um, our modeling and the, the information we have is that it's not enough actually to qualify as a route of regional significance. We did also consider it from the point of view of evacuation, and we know it is a very important potential evacuation route, particularly for Moraga, but could also come into play even for Lafayette and Orinda if there were some sort of disaster that, that broke people off being able to get from some of the southern portions of Orinda and Lafayette, they might actually need to evacuate through Moraga and out through that way. Um, there was a consensus, at least at the TAC level and ultimately at the policy board level, that those things did not raise it to the level of becoming mappable as a route of regional significance, but it was considered in some depth. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the council from Mr. McClure? Okay, Mayor McClure, thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Stella Witherspoon is coming over now, followed by Robert Leboy. Good evening, council members um, and staff and CCTA and consultants. Um, thank you very much for this presentation of the draft action plan changes to date. Um, I learned something new every single time I hear this. And so I do appreciate all of the work that you've been doing. Um, I wanted to, to speak about um, some comments that I sent in in a letter um, with respect to the roadway level of CERP, the roadway RTO three. Um, which would then take away any level of service standard for the intersection of Pleasant Hill Road and Deer Hill Road. And I know we've had some discussion, we've heard some information about the volume to capacity, but, um, but I, I just will say that, that removing that particular level of, stand, level of service standard means that the city is not only discontinuing trying to improve the intersection LOS to good D, which is what was in the within the current plan, which will soon be the pre previous plan. But it will also allow the intersection level of service to get worse with no upper limit. Level of service S, F, sorry, the, the acronyms are getting to me. Um, level of service F actually has no upper bound. It's 80 seconds or more of delay. Good D, I believe, is in the range of 35 seconds. 
um, we know that that intersection functions um, way beyond the minimum of F. I think in the in the plan, there's a table that says that the AM peak is 124 seconds, the PM peak is 211. Um, and so I understand that that's, that points to a big problem that we have. Um, however, in terms of thinking about this volume, volume to capacity ratio, the intent of many of the actions in the action plan are to reduce volumes, reduce auto volumes and single occupant vehicle volumes by increasing carpooling, increasing use of public transit, increasing active transportation modes, which are all good things. So I don't think we can say that the volume will, um, will, will always be what it is now. Maybe it'll increase a little, hopefully just a little. But I do think that it's important that we have some kind of a standard that we hold ourselves to, an aspiration or a goal to try for. Um, so perhaps it would be maintain what is now, not a very good level of service, F, or maybe add 10% onto the current delay that we're seeing in the 2019 values and say that's what we're, what we're aiming for. Um, I think it's really important to consider future changes. And I think I mentioned this in my letter, but I'll just very briefly say this is potential change way down the road in 2035 with um, respect to MTC's future freeways study where tolling might be introduced on freeways that have parallel public transit. That could be 680 and 24. MTC acknowledges that this might have the effect of distributing demand onto local roads. And that's a challenge that that study will have to sort out and tease through. So I think we need to think about not just what's happening now, but the future and, um, and really think hard about maintaining some degree of service for residents that depend on that road and on that intersection. Thank you. Hey, thank you for your comment. Uh, any questions from council members from Ms. Witherspoon? Okay, thank you very much. Robert Lavoie is coming in now. Mr. Lavoie, welcome. Good evening, council members and uh, staff and consultants. Um, I was sort of hoping this would be uh, postponed because of all the other stuff we have on the agenda, but um, there is a lot of uh, concerning issues here, and uh, I appreciate David's uh, super fast uh, summary. Um, it seems like, though, the overall goal is to uh, sort of um, eliminate cars and uh, increase bikes. Um, which I think is a great idea as a, as a biker, but uh, realizing how our city's laid out with narrow, windy, hilly roads, uh, it's really not very practical for large families and uh, um, most people. Um, so I, I just really wonder uh, how practical some of these goals are. Um, <clears throat> the uh, David said this is a congestion management agency, but then we talk about eliminating the level of service. And uh, I wanted to also find out if the, the return of the sales tax is based on population or some kind of income adjustment um, so that we might get less than uh, what would be our pro rata share um, or based on the source of the sales tax. Um, the, uh, here's, here's a comment that was concerning. It says, the action plan is written in a manner that supports and prioritizes non-automotive modes on certain routes of regional significance, including transit and act, act, active transportation, which is bikes and walking and so forth. Uh, quoting from the draft plan. Um, again, if we uh, if we push uh, bike lanes and so forth onto these regional transit routes, it's just gonna make the uh, capacity smaller and make the um, LOS even worse. Um, there's also a lot of huge goals for electrification um, talking about eliminating all the vehicles in just a few, very few number of years. And uh, um, I'm quite concerned about our electrical grid that already is unreliable. 
and uh, there doesn't seem to be a plan for making it more reliable. Yeah, we're talking about putting all the vehicles on the grid. And also, I'd like to remind people that when people charge their cars in the evening, about a majority of that uh, charging comes from uh, natural gas and other uh, fuel burn uh, sources. Um, But there's another concerning thing. It says uh, major collision, severe injury, and death can happen if safe system approach for infrastructure is not implemented. Um, I don't know that we're actually particularly on the high side for uh, uh, injuries and so forth. Uh, but then it says collisions that result in death and severe injury may, uh, increase particularly or proportionally without the safe system. And I I'm running out of time, but I guess the question is, uh, is there evidence that that some of these systems can actually uh, eliminate collisions resulting in death and severe injury? Um, I just I just don't think there's any evidence for that. Okay, thank um, you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly, Mr. would you like to answer that immediately, the, the, that question? And then there was one other question that Mr. LaVoy asked, and we'll come back to it. I'll answer the first question. Uh, the, the, the return to source funds comes from a combination of uh, road center line road mileage and population. Okay, thank you. And I guess, David, the, uh, the other question was about uh, the uh, LA, LSRPs, the roadway safety plan. And I, as I understood, the question was whether or not we believe there are actions we can take to reduce serious accidents, including deaths and serious injury to zero. Um, I, it's an ambitious goal. It is an articulated goal of the count CCTA's Vision Zero plan, as well as a number of other plans. So it's already been adopted by CCTA and other agencies as a goal. I do think it's ambitious. Some of the biggest issues um, are, one of the biggest issues really is drinking while driving and other intoxicated driving. There's distracted driving with cell phones. And there is, um, there obviously are weather issues. There's all sorts of things happening that are either completely outside of our control, like the weather, or very difficult to control, like distracted driving and intoxicated driving. So for all those reasons, it it's probably very ambitious to think that um, we will get to a level of zero. And at the same time, we do know that through education programs, as well as through um, geometric improvements at dangerous places, that we do see improvements and, and lessening of deaths and serious injuries. So um, we talked a lot as we put this plan together about whether the goal should be zero or if the goal should be something else. And we ultimately came to a consensus that on the both that nobody really wants to articulate a goal of only a few deaths. That's not, not really palatable to anyone. Um, and we already have adopted goals that say, let's try and get to zero. So we did move that forward. We do have a series of actions to try and um, make the roadways and other transportation systems safer. Those are in the plan. And I'll be honest with you and say, I, I don't think we're really gonna get to zero, but hopefully we'll get to a place where we're closer to zero. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Lavoy? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you, Mr. Lavoy. We we'll may see you later this evening. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you will. <laughs> Laura um, Hick will be joining your meeting, and she is our last speaker. Okay, thank you. And if anyone else would like to address the council, please uh, raise your hand on the screen. Hi, City Council. Good to see you. Happy New Year to everybody. Um, so I apologize if these questions were answered during the presentation. I was doing a little multitasking with bedtime, um, but I have two questions. So are there any plans or studies regarding um, increasing the county connection bus service to Akalani's High School? Specifically, I think it's Route 625. Um, and then my second question is, does the county currently support a formal carpool matching program? Um, and if not, would it be open to working with like our school districts or our city to create one that residents can utilize and tap into? So those are, I'm, as you, I'm, I have a seven-year-old, 
school's on the mind. Um, so those are my two questions and maybe just to throw an idea out there. Um, I know I live on Moraga Boulevard. We have the Lash Trompas school down the street from us. And I see some, a lot of times there's a County connection, like link shuttle, um, that sometimes just sitting there and I'm not sure. I think that's just reservation only, um, or they call ahead of time or it's this one specifically used, um, is used by Lash Trompas, but is there any potential way of maybe, optimizing those vehicles that could maybe supplement Route 625. Um, I know right now, from what I can see on the website, um, the bus to Akalani's only goes once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And I can just imagine if it just maybe ran during sort of that prime get to school, leave school window, maybe every 15 minutes versus just once or Maybe we can get more kids um, out of that carpool pick up and drop off line and using the bus because it's actually I've used it. It's actually really great. So, um, but yeah, so those are my two questions. Okay, thank you. Mr. Early, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, I, I can try, although my answers are going to be, I'm sorry to say, kind of vague, and I apologize for that. Um, this is a it's an overall plan. It's got a lot of larger programs in it. It does refer both to maintaining the, um, the the school bus program through County Connection, and it does refer also to um, encouraging carpool and, and ride sharing. And it kind of it doesn't really get more detailed than that. You're you're absolutely right that um, the according to the web at least uh, the Akalani's High Bus only runs once in each direction. Um, that is a thing that could be considered um, 511 Contra Costa helps to run that along with County Connection and they could be con you could contact them um, and they will do ongoing planning to use the funds that are available um, through the um, bus program to enhance service and that may be an enhancement they would make. Um, similarly, 511 Contra Costa on its website does have a link to a service called Merge. Um, which is um, a website that allows people to find carpool matches, and that may be something that could be expanded um, somewhat. And again, that would be a particular implementation uh, option that would be considered by 511 Contra Costa as it continues to implement those programs. And, and they do also work with employers to set up rideshare programs at, at particular worksite locations. Can I just ask, have they worked with a, like a, a body like this, like a school district or a city? They do work with the schools closely in terms of overall bike and ped. Uh, they do trainings at the schools. So whether they've done those actual um, ride match programs at schools for their employees, I'm not sure. Um, but they okay. do it for businesses in general, and then they work with the schools on bike and pet education. So probably somewhere I, I can put if if you want to reach out to me, I can put you in contact with them. Sounds good. Thank you. And, and I, I do want to say too, you know, I've, I've been a parent in the schools too. I mean, I think we all know that sometimes it's just a parent taking initiative to work on things. It may be that, um, uh, you know, using that software, that website that already exists, Merge, maybe if students were encouraged to really go on it and, and work together, they could use that. If everybody signed up, you'd probably get a lot of matching done and be able to reduce trips. So it may just be something that the schools individually could try and get people to use, given that the technology is already there. David, we haven't met yet, so you'll get to know me. I'm sure I will. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Are there uh, thank you. questions from any council members? Okay, seeing them, Ms. Herpich, thank you very much. Thanks. Are there Next, any other speakers? The last speaker is Cheryl, and she's coming over now. Okay, if anyone would like to speak, could you please, we need to have an indication of how many speakers we're going to have, because we have a, a long agenda tonight. So um, I'm just asking, please don't hold out to be the last speaker. Cheryl, we see you in the meeting. If you could unmute yourself. A little bit of a delay, sorry. I'll keep it short. Um, I just wanted to say that I supported S Stella's comments and uh, questions. Um, and I also wonder, the gentleman who spoke from Moraga brought up some good points about carpooling and the shuttles. I thought that was really interesting. And I wondered if carpool lots would be something that would benefit Moraga and Lafayette, maybe across from Makalani, there's that vacant lot there. 
it would be something that would be like what is off a rug here. And I had a general question. This is coming from the naive world and you said there were no stupid questions. So here's mine. What are the pros and cons of having Mount Down Boulevard put in place as a regional route of significance? Um, and how would that affect neighborhoods uh, and streets that intersect with Mount Down Boulevard all the way from the east end to the west end? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shell. Mr. Early, Mr. Kelly, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I guess the, the, the specific question being what are the advantages and disadvantages of designating Mount Diablo Boulevard? Um, to me, at least, there are really only advantages. Um, and what those are is that it requires the other two jurisdictions, Mara, uh, Moraga and Orinda, to work with you and inform you about projects that are underway or pending that might affect Mount Diablo Boulevard. Um, it also elevates Mount Diablo Boulevard to be a facility that is acknowledged as of regional importance and therefore perhaps more appropriate for regional transportation funding than it might have been thought to be if it didn't have that designation. I, I want to acknowledge there's no guarantee of funding because of that, but it does elevate the, the roadway in that regard. And so both CCTA and the MTC working regionally may be more likely to fund projects that the city would propose because of that designation. Um, it does, there's been some confusion about this, so let me say it does not give the other jurisdictions authority to decide what happens on that roadway. Each of the three jurisdictions still maintain control over their regional routes. And so you don't have to do something that say Morago or Rinda would tell you to do. It doesn't work that way. It does not um, require you to make improvements of a certain site, site type. It does not um, require you to try and maintain a certain level of service. Those things are all your in your jurisdiction still, but it does have those two features of cross-jurisdictional disclosure and elevating it um, for possible regional funding. So for in those re in the in that sense, I think it does the roadway does meet the definition of a route of regional significance. It does um, carry significant through traffic. It serves um, the region as a whole. It is of, of interest to all three jurisdictions in the sub area. So it does meet the, the requirements and the criteria. And I don't think there's really a downside. It's just the upside of those two things I mentioned. Would the neighborhoods, neighboring streets be protected as well? Would they be talked about? Uh, the, the, the designation applies to the major roadway only, so it does not, um, it doesn't really affect the side streets per se. Okay. Okay, are there any questions for Ms. McDonald? Okay, seeing that, Ms. McDonald, thank you very much. See, Clerk Robbins, are there any other speakers? No, there are no additional hands raised. Okay, we'll bring it back to the council. The council members have uh, comments. Council member Clark. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. I have two questions or comments. Number one regards the, um, the Pleasant Hill Road uh, level service. And I just wanna share my screen just so if we could go back to that for a second. Uh, and that is here. Can people see that? Yes, we see it. Okay, um, and this this does go to um, Stella Witherspoon and Councilmember Candell's comments as well. Uh, you, you mentioned that at the Pleasant Hill and Deer Hill Road intersection day, today we have a level of service aspiration of D as in David, right? And but yet when we measure it, we're actually at an F, which is worse than our than our desired goal. Um, and that you explain the structural reasons why it'd be difficult to um, expand it and improve it. And therefore, by 2050, we're still expecting it to be an F. Um, I wonder, is there a downside, though, of just continuing to have the goal of a D? Because <clears throat> in, it's an aspirational goal. Let's just continue to try between now and 2050 to make things better. That's a, that's a really challenging piece of the intersection there. And uh, if we don't succeed, well, then we didn't succeed. But it seems like if we just set it or remove the goal, then we don't pay attention to it. It will just, of course, get worse. And I, I do think I would like to see us actually try to make efforts there. And we don't know what technologies or how things will change. But if we 
if we have the goal, would it, would it be any downside to keep keep it as a D level goal? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mayor, is that a question you'd like us to try and answer at this point, or? Yeah, please do. Okay, I, you know, it's I, my answer is it's not really my place to tell you what policies you should make. This is up to your council to recommend to LPMC. LPMC will then take those things under advisement, and I know Councilmember Geringer will represent you well. I I do under as I understand things, I think that the the existence of that particular set of standards did become an issue, for example, in the terraces approval process and the lawsuits. My understanding is it might have created some confusion among some people, um, and that confusion wasn't necessarily a desirable thing. Um, but to the extent that everyone understands that it's only an aspirational goal, um, and I'm not sure we can ensure, we can promise that everyone will understand that it's only an aspirational goal, but if it really can be articulated to that as understood as that, I don't think there's a huge downside. Um, if it were up to me, I would probably say it's maybe wiser to do what Ms. Weatherspoon suggested of having an, an aspirational goal to not get worse, or even to maybe make a marginal improvement to getting all the way from F back up to good D, I think is, is a very strong aspiration and could cause confusion. But again, it's it's really your choice and um, and ultimately the choice of the LPMC policy board meeting as a whole of the, the three jurisdictions. Um, very good. Thank you for, for explaining it. It's helpful. Uh, the second question I have was related to the BART parking lot. And I, I appreciate how you've modeled the, the BART ridership given COVID and whether people are going to be going back to work and so forth. You also modeled first mile and last mile access to the BART. So I thought this was a very productive uh, uh, way of thinking about now through 2050 of how people would get to the BART. Uh, what I did not see in the discussion or observation was uh, from uh, the point of view of if we put housing on the BART parking lots in Lafayette in the future and uh, the parking quantity of parking spaces is reduced, uh, then what? how does that impact the planning between now and 2050 with regard to the other assumptions? So I would just uh, ask our uh, our representatives to see whether or not, uh, you know, we, we would in the next decade ahead like to uh, plan for housing on the BART parking lot with uh, therefore, a likely reduction in parking spaces for the public. And so I just wonder how that issue would be, um, could be synergized with um, this plan. That's just a comment, doesn't require an answer. Well, and I will just say, um, even though you don't, may not want an answer, I'm going to give you one anyway. Sure, thank you. Um, so um, we are, one of our, our um, RTOs is looking at access to BART. Um, so we will be tracking that over time. And we do up the, update this plan every five years, so we can be tracking that over time and update our our objectives and our actions that go along with that. So I think it's it's something that can, that can evolve over time because we are tracking, you know, the the access folks are taking to get to BART and taking into account the, the loss of parking. I mean, it, it's it's something that's happening whether we like it or not. Um, um, I live in El Cerrito, so it's it's happening in my neighborhood. Um, uh, so it's just about understanding the issue and being able to address it going forward. Thank you very much. Other council member comments? Okay, see, oh, council member Candell. Yes, I am. Um, I definitely support trying to get the LOS back in there, even if it's aspirational. Um, and the reason why is that's an evacuation route through a very high fire hazard severity zone. I mean, we, we just can't ignore that fact, right? That, that is our reality. And so I hope that our, our council can support bringing back, you know, even if it's an aspirational goal, and I would include it also through our downtown. Our Mount Diablo Boulevard is an evacuation route as well. And so um, I, I hope that I can get, you know, our, our council, I hope we can get that back in and keep those LOS goals in there. Thank you. Hey, other council member, or Vice Mayor Dawson. Uh, just a quick question uh, related to um, Mayor McClure's line of questioning about 
uh, St. Mary's Moraga Road, and that was under consideration, but I guess it didn't make the cut. But following uh, Councilmember Tandell's comment, that route also leads to Relief Station and Olympic and Pleasant Hill, which is a great alternate that people are taking and that traffic is building up as well. Um, so two things I would hope that is followed up then is that also is evacuation route, um, an alternate evacuation route for many of the zones here. And it's also um, with all the housing that is all these constituencies are coming up with will be also well trafficked. So how often do you actually reevaluate these routes um, in terms of regional significance and, and that that also comes from Oakland traffic? Well, we did. We just you, you mentioned specifically St. Mary's Road. St. Mary's Road was added to the map. It's not its own line, but it's part of the corridor. Um, of Moraga Road, St. Mary's Road, going into going up to the 24. Um, I, Trina, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have a couple of study intersections, certainly where St. Mary's Road meets, meets Moraga Road, and I believe we also have a couple more study intersections along St. Mary's Road. So that that has been added actually in this action plan in this round, this this five year update because of those comments. So we are doing that. Um, and back to your other question, yes, as Matt just said, these plans are updated every five or so years, and so there would be another update five years from now. And certainly in the meantime, there's nothing to keep um, Lafayette or Moraga to from tracking those intersections um, on their own, even if they're not tracked on the regional basis. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council Member Geringer. So a follow-up on the discussion. Um, David, back to um, Council Member Candell had mentioned so the primary discussion was Pleasant Hill and Deer Hill about the level of service and keeping uh, don't let it get worse or an aspirational goal. And then Council Member Candell mentioned Mount Diablo Boulevard, also an evacuation route. But could you um, uh, say again, I thought that there um, an LOS was um, added there, and I would have to go back and pull up my table, but that one hasn't been decreased, or did I? Um, no, actually, they, there, it is correct. Or removed, or, yeah. yeah. The, the, the way Councilmember Kendall expressed it is correct, that as drafted, the, exist, the new action plan in its draft does not have a level of service objective for either um, Pleasant Hill Road any um, at Deer Hill because of its proximity to the high school, nor the downtown intersections along Mount Diablo Boulevard because they're in the downtown. Um, so you you could add them back in. Um, you meaning really it would be up to LPMC, of course. Um, and but if you all tonight want to express that to your staff, ask your staff. Patrick in particular would come back to us at the TAC meeting in February, and we would work on specific language. Um, you don't have to exempt them. So you could try and set it at D, you could set it at E, you could set it at what it is today. You could say we're willing to accept today plus 10% or we want today, but we're going to aspire to no, we're going to try and get it at least down to only 90% of what it is today. Um, ultimately, it will be up to the three members of the LPMC policy board to make that decision. And that would be with input from all of you expressed through Patrick and ultimately Council Member Geringer through you as a as the member of LPMC. So um, another so another question. So you're um, saying that it, it's I guess so we put them back in. I'm not. Um, I will comment in a moment on, on kind of where I am. I appreciate very much the presentation and the excellent questions and public comment. And so I will just say that um, first off the bat. But if we um, change, you're recommending, you know, that that we don't um, change those um, levels of service that that you've done the, the modeling and um, having it as a goal and knowing that we're not able to achieve that. I guess, what are the ultimate, um, what's the ultimate sort of downside of, you know, having that aspirational goal and then not achieving it? Are there uh, penalties? And this is- uh, Right, there are, there are no penalties associated. I wanna be very clear about that. There's no, in that sense, there's no problem having an aspirational goal. 
I, the problem, I think, and I really think your staff or maybe CCDA staff, but maybe even more your own staff can speak to this. The question is, if you have that aspirational goal, does it then create confusion and perhaps even legal liabilities because of confusion about it for a project, for instance, like the terraces, which I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not meaning to really point out that project other than as an example that, and, and it is the, as I understand, it's the only example that has occurred in the entire county where what I would consider to have been a misunderstanding of what these goals are within the action plans, they have become the basis of um, a lot of public comment, a lot of public controversy, and ultimately um, legal action. And so uh, my only concern would be whether that's something that could happen again, whether there would be ongoing confusion, and whether that's a reason to avoid it. Other than that, I, honestly, I don't have a, a problem with you all setting aspirational goals. I, I guess I would also suggest that if you're going to add them back in, that you would acknowledge that they are aspirational goals and that they may it may not be possible to meet them, but you have them in because you do want to aspire to them. And I see Matt's hand up to maybe add some more. Yeah, yeah. I just want to confirm that the, there are no um, penalties for for not meeting those thresholds. However, you know, I think a lot of the thought that went in to to why we decided to remove the um, thresholds at some of these locations is because there the the trade offs, you know, against the active modes and the safety issues and things that you're by by saying you're going to prioritize level of service, whatever, whether it's D or something else that has some trade offs that, you know, could come at the expense of other goals, objectives in the plan. So I just want to make sure, you know, if, if you do come up with something that is um, that is uh, what word we're using. Uh, Sorry, my brain went aspirational. Back. Aspirational. That maybe it, that it is something like what Stella suggested earlier. That it's shall do no worse, or, or in, instead of naming a specific threshold, because then you're really putting that at play against other other considerations, um, and and really, you know, holding, you know, you know, like David said, it's it's really going to be tough to lower that F to a D. Maybe you can lower it to a low F, but you know. Councilmember Garrett, can I jump in here, please, with a question? One of our priorities um, for this year and most likely next year and the year after will be developing a Mount Diablo corridor uh, specific plan, updating our downtown specific plan, and as part of that, we'll we will be looking uh, very closely at how we can encourage. Uh, multimodal transportation, active transportation. Would it be reasonable to defer our own discussion of what we'd like to have as the uh, uh, level of service for each intersection when we do that plan? And if we do that, and as if part of our plan, we say this is what we're looking for as a level of service for each intersection, it, can we in effect, establish that within our, our own plan, and what significance uh, would that have? I'll I'll try and answer that as best I can. Um, I these are there are two separate documents we're talking about. Then one is the your LPMC action plan, which is ultimately adopted um, through the CTP by CCTA, and that is very separate from your own plan, both your general plan, your circulation element, and what you've mentioned, Mr. Mayor, the the plan for your downtown and Mount Apple Boulevard. So they are separate documents. They can have separate things in them. Uh, I do, I, it, this is more my opinion, I'll say now, which is that you probably create more flexibility for yourselves later if you don't put an LOS objective in place now. If you, if you ask very strongly through LPMC to have CCTA establish say LOSE as a standard, I'm just making that up in your downtown, and then you later were to decide that actually you can only get to LOSF, um, then you would be inconsistent with the action plan that you've already helped to create. So having no standard there, might this may be, seem counterintuitive, but I think it might give you a little flexibility later. Um, but again, I think it's perfectly fine for you to ask that LPMC change the draft to say something like no worse than it is today. 
Um, you can do that, and you probably still have a lot of flexibility within the context of, of your Mount Diablo Boulevard plan. I, you didn't ask this directly, but I do want to add that um, it is the case that enhancements for both transit and pedestrians and bicycles can have a negative effect on level of service for cars. Right. And many of us who do downtown planning accept the idea that in order to make a vi more vibrant downtown, we're going to enhance amenities for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for buses. And we understand that that may make level of service slightly worse for um, for the cars. And the city of Livermore is an example of this. I don't know if you've been in Livermore's downtown in the last 15 or 20 years, but they their, down, their main street, first street, was actually a state highway. It had two lanes of traffic in each direction. It had no real capacity for parking. It had dead businesses along it. They changed that street. They made it honestly much worse for through cars. They meant they did that very much on purpose, but they put in diagonal parking. They put in a lot of street trees. They made a lot of improvements, and they've really revitalized that street into one that is now, while it's it's not carrying as much traffic and the level of service is lower, I think everyone agrees that downtown Livermore is a much better place than it was. So yeah. you, you may, when you go to do that planning for Mount Diablo Boulevard, you may find yourselves actually wanting to make things quote unquote worse for cars yeah, in order to make it better otherwise. Exactly. That's the reason I asked the question. Yeah. And and there's no reason why that couldn't inform an update of the action plan. Um yeah. and, and that's and I see how Councilmember Kendall's hand, but that's exactly for in the case of the downtowns, that's the reason why countywide in all five action plans, we have recommended no level of service standard in the downtowns, precisely because oftentimes downtowns want to have uh, a, a worse level of service for cars in order to have other amenity for other kinds of users and transportation. So in that sense, I would I would encourage you as you make comments on this possibly to think about Pleasant Hill Road and the Deer Hill Road intersection maybe differently from the way you think about Mount Diablo Boulevard in the downtown. Hey, Council Member Kendall. I, and I totally understand that. That makes total sense. We're in a very high fire hazard severity zone. We have evacuation routes that we already are in our EIR, totally different than these other cities. And so what happens here is not necessarily what happens in the other cities. And we'll, I'm sure we're gonna be discussing that at length with our fire chiefs, right? And so that is not maybe what happens in other cities. And it's why maybe we wanna still create a level of service and not let it get any worse, at least for now, until we understand it. and and then pursue that later, right? It's always something that we can change later, it sounds like. And so to me, it, it seems very prudent to keep it for our city in particular, and then change it once we decide what we wanna do and talk to our uh, fire chiefs. Okay, does anyone, any council member have any comments on something other than the LOS? All right, do we wanna give guidance uh, to our council member in the group and to our technical team on LOS. Or do we want to, want to do it as a council? You want to provide individual input? How would you like to proceed? I, mean, I, I personally would like to put this in. I'd like our council to support it as well, at least until we understand it. Okay. And you know, talk to our you know con fire. Okay, let's start with Pleasant Hill Road. We'll take them separately because sure. I agree with you. <laughs> they are sure. they're separate. Mm -hmm. uh, so Pleasant Hill Road. Thoughts on Pleasant Hill Road? Do we want to uh, have a level of service for Pleasant Hill and Deer Hill? Yes. So just a straw straw vote here. Uh, yes. Council Member uh, Vice Mayor Dawson. I'd, I'd say yes. Um, I just, you know, I, I um, listening to David about his creating um, liability for that. I mean, that wording is shall is, you know, um, I'm just thinking that's a, a something to latch on to or, or not. So I guess it depends on how it's worded. But yes, I think there's a way we just want to aspirationally state that we, of course, are, are working on minimizing as best we can. But I'm not sure how to word that. Okay, well, just to put something out there, I would support aspirationally not getting worse. 
Um, I second that. And through the chair, I, I think we can work with your staff to try and get the language clear that it is aspirational. It's not a shall. Okay, I, um, I just just want to see if uh, if uh, that level is supported by three council members. We have two. Okay, we're looking for uh, another suggestion then. Council Member Tierringer. I know I'm receiving input, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but the aspirational, I, I definitely would support yeah, aspirational and the um, not some, and would rely on staff, I guess, to um, look at how to um, uh, quantify it, the not worse than in terms of the proposals that um, Stella um, brought forward in terms of um, percentages. And so um, having just seen it earlier today, Stella's, you know, proposal, I would want to, you know, under, understand more on that, but um, definitely support the aspirational piece of it. If we are going to, um, as a body, you know, recommend to LPMC that we um, um, hold those levels of service. Okay, Councilmember Candell, is your concern with the aspirational aspect or the? Uh... Yeah, yeah, and and I and I think it, it was um, Stella's point. If they put toll roads on the freeways, and Pleasant Hill Road gets slammed, what recourse do we have to try to get CCTA to help us out without a level of service? Right, and I know we can't we can't disprove any housing project because of LOS. We all know that, and so legally, I think we're covered with any of the housing projects. So um, that's why I'm not so concerned about putting, I, I, mean, I don't wanna put aspirational in there because the housing projects aren't gonna get affected by it. It's only outside things. And I do wanna have some recourse that we get some help. Oh, Council Member Dawson. Just a question, um, David, it, it, when this is reviewed every five years, could that be assessed then or, or you know, that level of service again where um, to yeah. that It absolutely our, will be assessed. Uh, whenever the next update happens in five or so years, the, you know, what I can't tell you what that reassessment might do, but no matter what you do now, it will be reassessed. Um, so, you know, if you if you put a standard in now, it might come out in five years. If you don't, I should have said objective. If you don't put an objective in now, it might still be put in in five years. All, any of those things are possible. It would definitely be reassessed. Okay, uh, Patrick, Mr. Goya. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that there are a number of actions in this um, report that are separate from the goals, but that do talk about developing sub-regional corridor management plans for Pleasant Hill Road. Um, these are in the roadway chapter. So there are actions that are identified that are intended to address congestion and multimodal travel along routes of regional significance, such as Pleasant Hill Road. So I want to point that out because that hasn't been- Good point. Thank you, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to state my position as I'm willing to, uh, uh, we each provide con uh, comment to our uh, representative and to our staff representative, and uh, we'll leave it in their hands. That would be my recommendation at this point on Pleasant Hill Road. I see th two heads nodding in addition to three heads. So the, so to get it, to get the wording right, to add level of service in a way that makes sense. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay, All right, yeah. sure. Okay, now, uh, uh, Mount Diablo Boulevard. And I'm going into this one still thinking we should keep that, well, we should consider that as part of our corridor specific plan, but I'm open to persuasion. But I, I'm not sure I see setting something now when we're gonna be looking at it in detail within the next year or two. I agree with that. And, but when is it going to get done? I mean, it'll get done in about five years when we reassess this, most likely, right? Um, and that's, Ooh, I to me, I think that's, that's our, case. I know, but this is the way things go in Lafayette most often. Um, and our loss grade there at Margaret Road, Mount Diablo, we're at 86 seconds, which is like almost a D. 
And that's what it used to be. And so I'm not thinking it's a bad goal to just keep it in for now as LOS of, of a D, you know, bad D and, um, and keep it there until we decide not to put it there. Okay, uh, Council Member Kwok. I I'm not ready to make a decision today, so I think we should do it later, right? I don't I, I think um, uh, to make the decision as part of the Mount Diablo specific planning time, and not to either put it in uh, put in a level of service at today's meeting or or not. There there are lots of complex reasons one way or the other. So I think this needs more time, at least for myself. So I would not be recommending anything today to change. Uh, to change the, uh, to make recommendation today. Okay, so but the status quo is that the uh, the plan would not have levels of service on Mount Diablo Bolt. Correct. Okay. All right, and uh, Councilman Geringer, I, I take it you are in a listening mode? <laughs> I was a listening and taking note mode, um, but I also, the two, hopefully, and the five years is coming back and reviewing the local action plan. Um, Carl, I mean, excuse me, Mayor Handori, the, um, what you're discussing in the downtown uh, congestion plan, the downtown expanded along Mount Diablo Boulevard, um, is in the next couple of years. And so I um, would like to have that flexibility and not have that, um, not added, have the LOS um, added back in for, or put in for Mount Diablo um, Boulevard until after we've done our work. And and hopefully that's ahead of the five years to, to council members Kendall's point. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see four heads nodding on that one. So, all right. Are there other comments? Um, or questions for CCTA or our consultants? And I, I, if there are none, I take it that we can each individually provide, uh, well, we should should we go through Patrick and uh, Council Member Geringer with our comments? Would that be the best way to do it? Yes, okay, and that's- for, We I should want that to avoid a Brown Act issue. Yep, yeah. okay. With Patrick, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, to Patrick. Okay, good. Uh, all right. And uh, all to Patrick. And the same for all of our residents who have comments on this. Uh, you can address your comments to uh, Patrick. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your uh, conducting this actually, or, or being willing to be part of a forum <clears throat> and answer the questions as they came up. I think that was very useful for our residents. So thank We're you. very happy much. to do it. Thank you for having us. Glad to be here. Thank you. All right, we'll sign off. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, we, we're going to go for another 15 minutes and then take a break. Uh, next is the consent calendar. Uh, do council members want to remove anything from the consent calendar? Seeing none, is there anyone in the uh, public who would like to remove an item from the consent calendar? I see no hands raised, Mayor Andori. Okay, can I have a motion for adoption of the consent calendar? Okay, moved by Vice Mayor Dawson, seconded by Council Member Geringer. Are there any comments? Nope. Uh, Council Member Kandel. Aye. Council Member Geringer. Aye. Council Member Kwok. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. And I'm an aye, so the consent calendar is adopted. We're on to item nine, <clears throat> old business our uh, annual budget, and I'll turn it over to our city manager and our city administrative officer. I am turning it over to Tracy for, uh, this is the final phase of your budget review, and uh, she is going to be highlighting the changes and the key points in the budget. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor and Jerry, members of the council. Um, I'm going to attempt to keep this within the 15 minute guidelines <laughs> that it was given. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to be very succinct. The uh, purpose of this final budget is that it, it uh, refines the proposed budget. Basically, what we do is we put in the actual figures 
for revenues and expenses for the prior fiscal year. It incorporates changes that have been adopted by the city council since the proposed budget was approved, um, and then recommendations from department directors as they respond to current conditions. So I'm not gonna go through in detail all of the changes. Those um, changes are all in the city manager's memo which is the first part of the budget, but I am gonna go through a couple of things that I think are very important that I wanna call your attention to. Um, and then I have uh, two potential um, amendments that I would like you to consider. So overall, the bottom line is that um, for the fiscal year 22-23, which is the fiscal year that we're currently in, um, the general fund, uh, we expect that the general fund reserve at the end of the year will be 12.8 million, which is about 68%. And that is over the reserve target by 1.45 million. Um, I will note that that act does include um, this fiscal year. Um, one of the changes was it did include the uh, purchases of two properties, one of which has been completed. Um, one of which is still under negotiation. Um, so that is one of the big things that was changed. Uh, we took $1.7 million of those purchases, of the purchases from the general fund um, and the rest of that money came from the city offices fund as a loan. Um, so once the um, parcels have been purchased, then we will have additional conversations about uses and how we fund that. Um, but again, the bottom line is even given those purchases, uh, the general fund still remains at 68%. However, this is what one thing I do wanna point out, um, that given the five-year model still predicts um, ongoing deficit spending, um, if that trajectory continues, we won't really be able to maintain the general fund reserve goal beyond uh, fiscal year 25-26. Um, the other major change uh, that I want to call your attention to specifically is in the revenue forecast. Uh, you heard, I believe, in December, I think it was December, um, from Avenue, which is our uh, consultant to help us that uh, helps us predict um, and forecast sales tax that um, there was a change in their forecast for ongoing sales tax numbers. Um, and those sales tax numbers actually their forecast decreased. You'll see this in the report um, over a five year period. Um, they changed their forecast uh, about $660,000 over the five years. Um, that's not great news. It certainly can change, um, but that is something that is also putting some pressure on the overall five-year budget. So I wanted to point that out. So I'm going to move quickly to, at the end of the city manager's report, uh, I have a section called challenges and opportunities. And um, I'm just gonna go through all those things because I think this, these are important policy decisions that are gonna be needed, uh, that the council is going to need to consider over the next few years. So I do want to uh, call that out. Um, so as I mentioned, the five-year model shows ongoing structural deficits of over 700,000 annually. Um, for the next four years, these deficits are eased somewhat by releasing money from ARPA that was set aside specifically um, for the revenue losses that were identified due to the pandemic. So we're releasing that money over the next four years at about $220,000 per year. Um, this second bullet point is not news, um, but again, pointing out that the two main sources of ongoing deficit are the core area maintenance, maintenance and stormwater pollution. So as has been the case for several years, the revenue for those two programs do not cover the expenses and the gap widens every year. 
So together, those programs account for a deficit of about $500,000 per year. So that's a majority of what we're talking about, of what is causing the deficit spending in the general fund. Um, and that's just putting an ongoing, it puts ongoing strain on the general fund um, and it squeezes out opportunities for uh, other programs. For example, if those gaps were bridged, the council will potentially have enough money to cover the additional staff that was hired to deliver on council's stated priorities and other necessary work uh, as was outlined in the staffing study. Um, there are some deferred maintenance projects that have not been funded that are not in this budget, specifically the patio at Buckeye Fields designed for the HVAC system at the community center um, and parking lot repaving at the community center, Buckeye Fields and the community park. Um, so altogether, those are about $900,000 in deferred maintenance projects that we will need to fund over the next several years. Um, again, depending on what the uses decided for the new properties that we intend to purchase, we will have to figure out how to pay for those properties. Um, for example, we took $1.7 million out of the general fund anticipated to pay for that. Um, if we recouped that cost somehow, uh, it would allow the city to meet at 60% annual reserve goal for an additional two years. Um, this is something I have told you about before, but it bears repeating. Uh, the parking program uh, continues to be about $100,000 in deficit uh, every year. This is very, very different than pre-pandemic years in which we actually generated surplus funds in parking in the parking fund, uh, which we set aside to purchase or uh, develop new parking. Um, but since the pandemic, we have lost revenue. And some of that decrease can be attributed to using parking spots for downtown for outdoor dining, but certainly not all of it. Um, it's very possible that the pandemic altered traffic patterns and behaviors in such a way that revenue may never return to former levels, even after the additional outdoor dining ceases. Um, at some point, the council may want to consider raising the hourly parking rate, which has been um, at a dollar for, I think, um, over 20 years. Um, and then finally, um, inflation and recession may have impact, unknown impacts on revenues and expenses. Those will remain to be seen, but I think it's something that the council needs to be cognizant of. Um, now, I also have two sort of amendments that I would like for the council to consider that uh, for this particular budget. Um, one was um, a typo. Um, I was, I say in my narrative that we put um, $75,000 additional money into 550, which is general expenses to accommodate um, expenses that were part of the office upgrade, some furniture and whatnot. Um, I am missing $25,000 due to a typo. So I would like to include an additional $25,000 um, in fund 550, just so we would have enough money that we can cover some of those expenses. Hopefully we won't have to spend it all. Uh, so I'd like that. The second thing is just to bring to your attention that in December, the council did authorize a bonus pool um, that was basically paid for out of um, staff vacancies. So there's a bonus pool of $225,000 uh, that you authorized. Um, and again, was basically paid for by uh, vacancies that we have not had positions filled. I did not include that lump sum figure because I would have had to go through and take those vacancies out of a number of programs. And I felt like it would really skew the five-year model because I wanted to make sure that the five-year model was 
showed you what a fully staffed um, city looked like. So this is really just um, accounting. So there's two ways that we can handle it. One is for you to go ahead and just adjust this budget by $225,000 in Fund 550 with the understanding that we will definitely come in under budget by a similar amount in, uh, in other programs combined. Um, or you could just leave the budget as it is. Um, and in October of next year, when we're in the middle of doing the audit, um, we will probably come to you and say, hey, this particular budget was over budget by 225,000. You had already authorized that expense, but you will see, in fact, that we were under budget by a similar amount. Um, so I think the cleanest and easiest thing to do, the thing that Jennifer wants me to do is ask you just to also authorize that $225,000 so we can put it in the budget. It would probably make the auditor happy, um, just with the understanding that we will definitely be coming in under budget um, in several other areas for um, personnel expenses. So uh, with that, I am going to just leave it open for questions from the council. Okay, we'll take questions from the council, then we'll take public comment and then come back for comments. Council Member Kwok. Uh, so just to clarify your last, um comments, you're recommending the option A, the first one, as opposed to the second version, right? That would make the auditors happier. That's yeah. that's your rec that's staff's recommendation. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Just to... Oh. Oh. Thank oh, you. Awesome. Tracy, was it 225 for the staff bonuses you want to move over and an additional 25 for the typo, just so it technically is, is 250, it, it goes into- yeah, Actually, I think it's 225 plus 10, so a total of 235 for city manager bonus, and yes, 25, and they're all in account 550. Okay, so 235 and 25 into 550, okay. Um, I, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Any that. questions? Oh, sorry. No, no, that wasn't a question. So. Okay. Uh, let's open it for public comment. City Clerk Robbins, is there anyone who would like to comment on this? That is raised. This is the budget item. If anyone would like to speak to the city council on this budget item, please raise your hand now. Mayor Andrew, I see no hands raised. Okay, we'll bring it back to the council for um, comments. Uh, are there any any comments, Council Member Kwok? Sure, I'd like to comment. I appreciate uh, the mention of the structural deficits we're having in core area maintenance and stormwater pollution. Uh, this is something that you regularly bring to us, and the number is a big number, right? Five hundred thousand dollars per year of unfunded costs. And given the, uh, what is stormwater pollution? Just, I think, uh, just to clarify, we we just saw these massive storms, right? And then I walked down to the creeks and you just see the creeks just, right? All of that uh, water going out. Well, all that debris that's from our, uh, is also being put into the bay, right? And so the stormwater pollution fees are really, but for all the pollution that is coming from each city, uh, somebody has to, you can't pollute the bay for nothing for free. We need to have some funds to clean up the bay, right? So my my understanding is that that word stormwater pollution is really related to what we're seeing now and trying to mitigate for that type of damage. So uh, just to confirm if that understanding is correct. And then secondly, this is a issue that all cities around uh, that have. And I wonder whether other cities have try to figure out a solution for it and is there any collaborative way or even sharing notes to find out what other cities do to deal with this uh, rising fee which i think is a good thing but it's certainly a liability that's quite expensive so i wonder whether uh, we know any tips from other cities or are there collaborative opportunities that if we did things together that it would cut down on our cost but i think to just 
you know, hear it every year and that it's there. So I think I'd love to do something about it too. Thank you. So I, if I can respond, I think that that is, those are all really good questions. I think that it might be worth um, agendizing at a future date um, because this is technical. It's some engineering. I believe that um, director, the engineering director, Mike Moran, would be more knowledgeable about the, um, there are certain specific things that the Bay Area quality, uh, uh, Water Quality Management District requires that cities do. We do get some revenue, um, but those requirements increase every year and our ability to collect revenue stays the same. Um, this is a well-known problem. Yes, absolutely every city uh, faces it. So I think it might be worth, at least for a better understanding, that we agendize it so we can get more technical. I don't have the technical answers, but yes, it's something that I think that we've been working on. Other comments? Okay, I would I would just comment. I appreciate uh, in the report the mention of deferred maintenance, and I would just say, I think the city has uh, talking about public works, talking about uh, Tracy, you and Jen and your team, and the city manager. All departments have really done well in terms of keeping our infrastructure repaired and our residents and approving years ago the first bond measure for roads and storm drains really set the stage for the structure we have now that really with a lot of work went in by the city the police department public works over the last two weeks to keep us all safe but we have the basic infrastructure that was able to do it so it just shows the value of these investments and why we have to continue to maintain them Okay, so with that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the final 22-23 budget with the amendments of adding uh, $25,000 to fund 550 for renovation and 235,000 to fund 550 for uh, the salary pool and the uh, city manager bonus. I still move as stated. Okay. A second. So a motion from Vice Mayor Dawson and seconded by uh, Council Member Candell. Um, Council Member Candell. Aye. Council Member Geringer. Aye. Council Member Kwok. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. Okay, and I'm an aye. So Tracy, thank you very much to you and your team for bringing this to you uh, to us, and we look forward to uh, uh, further discussions of the next budget as we get into that budget season. So thank you. All right, we will take a break until 10 past nine. Uh, just for members of the public who are on here, we, we have an, a policy which I plan to stick to uh, during this year of taking a break so we can get up and walk around and get a little circulation uh, every two hours. So um, we will break until 9.10. Thank you.
All right, it is 9.10. And it looks like everyone is back. Okay, so we're on to <clears throat> item 11A. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Planning and Building Director Wolf to present the staff report. He's joining your meeting now as his consultant, Diana Elrod. Good evening. Are you are you seeing the uh, presentation on the screen? Yes, thank you. Very good. Uh, good evening, members of the council, members of the public. We are before you again with the housing element update. Um, we will attempt to be thorough but brief. Um, so tonight we're going to just give uh, an overview of, of where we are um, with respect to the schedule, the environmental review that's been done today, and, and with minor revisions. Uh, speak to the comments we received from HCD and the revisions to the to the materials in response. Uh, talk about goals, policies, and programs, opportunity sites, AFFH, and other minor revisions. Um, so I think it suffices to say that the bulk of what we will speak to tonight has already been discussed by the council um, in your meetings, uh, your, your meeting in August, two in September, uh, to in November and uh, the December 12th meeting. And so um, largely it is review for the council and the public. And uh, um, so trying to button everything up before we uh, ask for your certification of the EIR, adoption of the housing element and submission to the state. Uh, so we ask that you conduct a public hearing, provide feedback, adopt resolutions 2023-04, certifying the housing element, adopting a statement of overriding considerations because there are uh, one or more significant and unavoidable impacts, adopt the mitigation and monitoring reporting program, and then adopt resolution 2023-05, which would adopt the six cycle housing element. As you probably well know, the housing element is a, a required part of the general plan. It's the only element which is subject to uh, state review on an ongoing basis. And our deadline, like all other Bay Area jurisdictions, is to adopt by January 31. So uh, a week and a day from now. Um, we have been allocated uh, 2,114 units to plan for through the RENA process. Uh, it, the housing element speaks to housing need. Um, it establishes and requires us to establish goals, policies, and programs to further uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing and achievement of our housing goals. Um, and uh, again, accommodate the RENA. So with respect to public outreach and engagement, um, GPAC started uh, this process uh, late 2020 and, and had went through uh, multiple, many meetings in 2021 and uh, into 2022. Um, we held six housing element 101 sec uh, sessions. Yeah, Greg, Greg, I think we're okay on this slide. Very good. Happy to move on. And so this just uh, again covers that the Planning Commission reviewed the housing element and EIR and are recommending uh, both. That happened uh, on January 3rd of this year. And uh, you have tonight and a potential date uh, held one week from today if, you, if, if needed. With respect to environmental review, um, I think you, you well know what environmental impact report is. And what it covers, you established uh, 10 growth geometries early on and two scenarios to study, a distributed scenario and a downtown only scenario. Um, again, doesn't analyze any one specific project, but those are the two projects or the project and the alternative that were studied. And as a over a high umbrella, the, it studied up to 3,400 units and, and we're coming in less than that. Um, 
So must be certified before uh, adopting the housing element update. Um, and it's required to be looked at by both the Planning Commission and City Council. Once again, Planning Commission did. Um, as you know from prior meetings, uh, you, you held three on the, on the EIR and then Attorney General Bonta's guidance came out. We took some additional time to analyze that with respect to what the city had done, found a large concurrence between the two and amended the EIR with some minor revisions to articulate how what the Attorney General wrote uh, aligns with what we had done to date. Um, this is simply a uh, pull quote from the resolution that's in your packet. And it says, based upon direction from the council, uh, planning areas seven, eight, and nine, one are no longer in consideration for inclusion in, in the draft, EI, in the EIR and the housing element update. Uh, the discussion was because those areas in part are in very high fire hazard severity zones and the city acknowledges that uh, there, the half of the city essentially is in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Um, and in response to that, the, the council eliminated those areas which are in very high fire hazard severity zones uh, and thus directed staff to focus on a downtown only option. So um, public comment submitted for today uh, included a proposed edit by Colin Elliott and it's on screen in red where it provides just additional clarification um, that the city initially considered and analyzed 10 planning areas. Uh, however, the council's direction in November was to amend the project description in the EIR and to eliminate those areas in very high fire hazard severity zones. So it's a seven, eight and nine here. I'll, I'll for the record note that Nine one, which is the larger De Silva site on the south, is in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Uh, De Silva site north, uh, nine two is not, and so that that remains in inventory. And further, uh, because we we also received comments that it wasn't clear that those areas had been removed from the EIR, um, and they're happy to point to where they are where the project description amend is amended and says that, but but we um, want to be further clear and propose uh, the following red line on the final EIR page one six. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Diana Elrod, who will speak to you about HCE. Great, thank you. Thank you and good evening. Uh, just as a reminder, there are only two ABAG jurisdictions right now that have a certified housing element as of the beginning of the year. Uh, Redwood City is close to being certified, but it is not actually certified yet. Um, we submitted the draft on June 30th, 2022. We received a 13-page comment letter, uh, and the revisions that you have before you are shown in red line. These are also summarized in the HCD comment response matrix, which is attached to the staff report where we've gone line by line to say how we've responded. And we've also included additional explanatory narrative and analysis and timelines. That's primarily what we did, specifically with respect to the goals, policies, and programs. Next slide, please. All programs receive more definitive timelines for completion per the letter. Some programs were revised to include additional required information or actions. Some programs were added that were required by law. Two programs were removed because of project re projected resources and or time constraints. And the city council already reviewed and updated these, pro these updated programs, just as a reminder in November 28th. I'm not gonna go through this, but this is the laundry list of everything, including uh, those items that were taken out, those items were changed or added, and their sequence in a Gantt chart, so we can understand we can understand when they get have to be completed. With respect to opportunity sites, this I believe is Greg. Is it not, or is that still me? I'm happy to take it. Uh, so, with respect to opportunity sites, the the council directed in November um, to modify the prior. Uh, inventory um, to eliminate 
the the BART site and and not include the DeSilf South site, as I mentioned, because they're in very high fire hazard severity zones. Um, to focus on a downtown only, to also um, tier the density southward from the freeway where there is the highest uh, topography and uh, would best be able to nest uh, density against those and um, to the degree we can keep a lower profile at the boulevard with stepping uh, to the north. Um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, submitted a letter which we considered and, and brought back uh, revisions, uh, scenarios for the council to consider and uh, it proposed increasing density in areas two, three, and five. I think we've addressed those to, to the best of our ability. Um, and the, the Planning Commission is recommending uh, a, the revised opportunity sites inventory that's in your packet. Um, so the, the map on the screen is a density map of that uh, revised inventory. And it shows the highest density of 75 dwelling units per acre um, to the north along the freeway. Once again, areas seven and eight north of the freeway are, are have been eliminated as they're in a high fire hazard zone. Um, density is stepping down towards the boulevard um, and further stepping down to the south towards the residential, uh, single family residential, essentially. So one of the opportunity site changes in the table uh, is an expansion of site 36. Uh, in June, the, the inventory included 0.91 acres, which is the light blue uh, polygon. Um, and it has, a, a, I think, three property owners, um, perhaps just two. But then in discussion with uh, the property owner to the west, I'm sorry, east, um, behind and adjacent to Safeway on the east. Um, there's support for expanding that site, uh, that being a, a more likely part of the overall center that would uh, could potentially redevelop without affecting the multitude of smaller uh, leaseholders and, and uh, Whole Foods to the east. So here's the summary of the opportunity sites inventory, I'm sorry, that uh, the Planning Commission considered and is recommending. Um, this reflects the, the densities in each of the areas on the map on the preceding slide. Um, I will note the small area of concern for staff is that um, overall the, the buffer is, um, adequate. However, the, the focus of HCD, as we mentioned before, is in the very low income and low income, which combined is, is right on the cusp uh, of the 15 to 30 percent recommended um, by HCD. On screen is uh, proposed by Colin Elliott. He submitted a comment letter, um, which we reviewed today, which uh, would have area 1B, 3B, and 4 remain uh, at 35 dwelling units per acre. Um, you'll note that two of the three don't have any opportunity sites in them. Uh, the last does. And so the, the numbers on the right um, diminish slightly, um, but still hold at the 14%. One or more public commenters uh, encouraged the city council to increase the number of accessory dwelling units and accommodate more of the arena through ADUs. Um, the HCD has told us explicitly that we must use an average of the last four years and, and use that as the uh, basis for projecting accessory dwelling units going forward. So uh, if we do take that average, um, we have projected 30 dwelling units per acre, totaling 240 over the eight years, uh, which is an increase above what the average is over the last four years. Um, but certainly you can see the, the trending from 2018 
with only nine accessory uh, dwelling units proposed uh, to 62 units proposed in this last year. So it has ticked upwards significantly since 2020 when the ADU, uh, the, the state implemented streamlining with respect to a multitude of ADUs. So we expect those numbers to hold steady or, or increase moving forward. And I want so. to add also that HCD specifically requires us not to look at approved units, but permitted units. So we can't average the approved units, but rather the permitted units. Thanks, Correct. Greg. And, and so there, there, HCD, there, there's no assurance that just because they receive approval means that they will get a permit and build it. Um, we have sent out a survey to applicants to try to understand that better. Um, and there's a, a variety of, there, it's not a big sample set at this point in time, but of a variety of reasons. Um, but if they have actually gone ahead and, and pulled a building permit, the, the state has higher confidence that those uh, will ultimately be finished. And naturally there's a lag time from approval to submission and issuance of a building permit to uh, completion of the new unit. So Diane. I'm gonna pick up now on uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing. This is, a, as you know, uh, a new component of housing elements. Next slide, please. The site inventory analysis, we needed to find out, does the proposed location of future units improve or exacerbate concentrations of poverty or poor environmental outcomes, et cetera? We have to understand an analysis of segregation and integration within the community and outside. We looked at fair housing enforcement and capacity and look at programs to address disproportionate housing needs to also improve mobility and prevent displacement. Next slide. Um, some of the outcomes from the site analysis, although multifamily housing, including affordable, tends to be clustered in the downtown, these are areas of the highest opportunity or close to transit and are in healthy communities. There are not high rates of poverty in these areas and providing new affordable housing in them would not exacerbate conditions. This is according to the study that was completed by RIP policy. Uh, additionally, providing affordable units in these areas will help stabilize households and prevent further displacement. Uh, lastly, they know that additional affordable units through the ADU program will be distributed throughout the community to further um, add affordable units throughout the community. Uh, a comment was raised by um, uh, uh, East Bay for Everyone, I believe it was, a concern about uh, locating affordable housing near uh, Highway 24. Um, and each year, you know, California's air gets cleaner and that that will only further improve as electric cars become a larger segment. Uh, this shows how over time uh, the, um, the tons of um, nitrous, what is it? Uh, what, is, what is it? NOx. NOx. But, and and, and we've reached out to uh, BACMED and CARB and um, they indicated, you know, we don't have site specific data for Highway 24 in Lafayette, but the, this is the overall trending and um, BACMED is attempting to get us further granular information. Um, but NOx is a, is a good proxy to look at for right. overall air quality. Um, and this is consistent with uh, everything that we have seen. And right. And one of the other analyses that was conducted as part of the AFFH uh, by root policy was looking at um, environmental outcomes and whether there are areas of the community, including near freeways and so forth, where there expected to be poor outcomes and there was no projected poor outcomes near uh, the freeway. And I'm gonna briefly list the other minor revisions we made. Uh, Appendix B, since the last time you saw it, we provided more land use control analysis. Uh, Appendix C, which was the inventory, we provided a lot more information on the progress to meeting RENA, the RENA allocation previously, including projects that are in the pipeline. We provide data on recent projects involving consolidations of lots. 
uh, and we beefed up the conversation about suitability of non-vacant sites for development of housing. Appendix G, goals, programs, and policies. Uh, since the last time you saw it, we provided, which was a request by HCD, is provide specific acreages and densities for zoning to accommodate RITA. Next slide. So the recommendations that we have before you tonight, conduct a public hearing, provide feedback to staff, adopt a council resolution 2023-04, certify the, uh, certifying the housing element update, environmental impact report, adopting a statement of overriding consideration and adopting a mitigation monitoring and reporting program. And lastly, adopt resolution 2023-05, adopting the six cycle housing element update. With that, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, we'll <clears throat> follow our usual pattern. We'll have council questions, then we'll go to community comments and questions, and we'll come back for council discussion. Uh, but before we do that, before we even have council question, I, I would like to ask um, Planning Director Wolf to address uh, one issue uh, that's come up, and that's uh, <clears throat> the messages that we received from the uh, Glen neighborhood about uh, how uh, the fire danger is referred to. And I, if you could address, you know, how that's handled. Um, I mean, my reading of the environmental impact report is that it does state that the Glen is in a very high fire severity zone. Um, well, I'll let you uh, explain how it's handled and what the implications are for any future plan development, um, yeah, plan or development. Thank you, happy to speak to that. And, and it is a clearly very sensitive issue for the community, this neighborhood in particular, but also for staff and council members. I know that significant effort has been put into this issue with the creation of Firewise Councils and uh, republication of an updated um, Lumber and uh, Residence Guide to Wildfire, et cetera. The, 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 um, it is a, high priority, if not the highest priority, is public safety and the recognition of uh, this community and certain parts of it being at higher risk than, uh, than most. So I think going back even further, before uh, Draft Housing Element and the EIO were published, we advocated strongly for uh, recognition that half the community is in a very high fire hazard severity zone and, and um, on that basis, appealed uh, our arena allocation to ABAG. Um, I think we were the only community is in that situation. Um, we advocated that that be a factor and, and recognized in the allocation process. And ultimately, the greater body that uh, created the methodology only chose to include three uh, factors. Uh, two were transportation related and one was high resource access to high resources areas. So the, the, the natural hazard risk was not factored in despite our uh, advocacy for it. Um, so the, the EIR does acknowledge that uh, half the community is in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Um, the, there is guidance uh, through appendix G and uh, case law that uh, essentially to help inform the, the decisions uh, about level of significance in an EIR. Um, and essentially the, the guidance is whether the, the project, the, the new growth would impede the city's ability to execute its emergency operations plan and evacuation plan. And based on our discussions and the public attendance from the chief of police and the assistant uh, deputy director, sorry, deputy um, chief uh, McAllister, um, their assessment is both that 
we it would not impede at the city's ability to execute its emergency operations and evacuation plan noted that it would certainly take more time to evacuate more people um, in more vehicles but case law so uh, the the ruling on topic um says that simply by itself in increased evacuation time does not itself constitute a uh, significant uh, and unavoidable impact so there are uh, if and when a project is proposed uh in well uh in let's say the the bark parking lots um additional environmental review and project specific environmental review would be required would be required and at that point in time information like points of ingress egress how the um, traffic control uh, mechanisms would work um, signal preemption other factors would then be able to be evaluated um, in a project eir um, rather and and not at a at a broader higher level of a, the programmatic eir that's before us so subsequent environmental review uh, will be necessary for any project that is proposed uh, north of the freeway. Does that? Yeah, let, let me, let me, okay, we, we have a draft EIR, we have a final EIR, and we have the 80 page resolution we're adopting this evening. Is it correct to say that the 80 page resolution we're adopting this evening makes no finding with respect to the um, impact? uh um on the glen and sets no precedent with respect to impact on the glen of the of uh, alternative one the distributed alternative correct the the distributed sites scenario is is no longer a component of the uh, eir and thus the the resolution does not make a conclusion surrounding scenario one, the distributed site scenario. Okay, would it be correct to say that if our next step were to do an overlay district for the BART lots, uh, that we would need to make environmental findings and that we would not be bound by anything that's in the draft EIR or the final EIR? That is correct. I would say informed by, but not bound by. The you know, at, as new information is considered, you, you you will have every opportunity to make a conclusion based on that at the time. You're not bound by a historic finding. Okay. And can you confirm that the EIR, the draft EIR, the final EIR, and actually the resolution does state that the areas north of Highway 24 are in very high fire severity zones. I say with high degree of certainty, yes, it does. Okay. Yes, those those documents do. Certainly, the draft EIR, and they they frankly, all three documents explicitly state that those areas are no longer part of the project. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Questions from council members. Council member Kendall. Sorry. So um, I just want to totally agree, I think, with your analysis. I'm just making sure that the um, Mr. Elliott's changes to the resolution plus that little extra change to the final EIR are your recommendation tonight. And that is going to be what we vote on. Okay, that's correct. Perfect. I just, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Are there other questions? Did somebody raise their hand? All right, if not, then I've, okay, Council Member Clark. Sure, I had a question about the accessory dwelling unit calculation. There was a slide there presented of approved versus permitted. And uh, there was a discussion about, uh, I mean, I think you showed that in light of some public comments that said there had been a precedent in your Belinda, Southern California, that might've been something different, but uh diana said that um we've gotten guidance that we need to pick the approved versus permitted and we need to go back four years and not just two so if we pulled up that slide and is that what uh, maybe if you just pull it up for our it's our permitted reference. not approved yes and we've been explicitly told by hcd that we cannot rely on any 
experience in Southern California pertaining to ADUs or other methods of understanding the inventory. HCD has been explicit in telling us Yorba Linda was its own thing and we can't rely on it. And it's not just Yorba Linda, it's anything in Southern California. Okay. In so terms of we, the inventory. Right. So if we went back four years, would we be starting with 2022, that 37 units plus 21 units plus 15 plus seven? And so if right. I add that up on my little trusty calculator here, I get 80 and we divide it by four, it equals 20 per right. year. But we we believe, you know, right now we still have in the inventory 30 units per year. We think we can still make the, a good argument for that because of the, not only the number of units that have been approved um, and how it's the trajectory has gone up. We have a lot of d discussion in the housing element explaining how there is this uptick uh, in both approved and permitted that we believe that we have a good case for saying 30 units uh, per year, but not any more than that. Okay, so you're already upticking it because the average of those, just so, uh, for everybody's benefit is uh, of those numbers is 20 per year, but right. we're going to propose 30 per year. And so times eight equals 240. That's the number you're plugging into uh, our submission, right? 240, that's, that's a number 50% bigger than our four-year trailing average would show. Correct. Okay. And and part of the the rationale is that the the council endorsed a um, incentive program wherein fees for ADUs are reduced um, for the next I believe it's four years and so that should incentivize those numbers further. Okay, terrific. So that was just one clarification I wanted to make, uh, or at least better understand. And then the second one that uh, Greg before you, before you sorry before you go on to your second, can I ask a follow up on the ADUs if we could get that that slide back because I I just want to make sure I understand that showed that in 2022 there were 21 permits and only five completed. Is that what you would expect given the timing of building ADUs? And I noticed for 2020, it's 15 permitted, but only seven completed. I know that one of our 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 programs is to go back and ask people what their experience is. But mm -hmm. do, do we know? I, I'm just thinking if if anyone were to dig deeper into this, here mm -hmm. we've got this that shows that the completion numbers have not you know, kept up with the well, don't match the even the permit numbers, let alone the approved numbers. I think it's hard to really. Uh, suss that out, but my guess would be supply chain issues during the pandemic, uh, inability to find contractors to do the work. Um, just there are a lot of issues that just ground a lot of things to a halt during the pandemic. So that's my kind of gut level guess of what happened and why we're not seeing a lot of completed, although people are definitely applying for them and people are definitely you know, getting permits for them. So I think I'm I'm hopeful that, I think part of the problem is also cost. I think that a lot of people have been surprised by how much cost, how much it costed to build even a simple ADU at this point. And like Greg said, we have, you know, activities, uh, programs in place to sort of further incentivize the development of ADUs that would perhaps set some of the cost anyway. Correct. And in the form of reduced fees and then also to simplify the process and, and make it cheaper by having pre-approved plans. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Councilmember Kwok, I, I apologize. Back back to you. Oh no, I'm glad you asked that question. Um my other question, and I wonder if you could pull up the slide that talks about the opportunity sites and the 14% buffer for the very low income and low income. And um, just I, I think that when we saw this slide uh, in November 28th version of it, uh, that that 14% there, which is, yeah, the combination of very low income and low income, that number used to be 20%. Uh, so now when we see it again, it's 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 a it's a decline down to 14%. And when we looked at the 20%, there was a note there that said, quote, the target buffer for lower income should be at least 15 to 30%. 
and we were at the 20%, sort of right in the middle there. Now we're we're falling just under the range of 15%. So I wonder if you can comment on what happened there. How did we drop down? And then also, is it really, is there any way that we could submit a number and a proposal that where we brought this number back into the target buffer of 15 to 30% rather than submitting what we see on this page as is at 14%? Um, I don't have hard data on on an analysis on the the specifically why the number went down, but I, we did go through the the changes that were made to the uh, opportunity sites. Um, one of those included uh, recognition. A member of the public identified that there were um, one of our sites uh, off of Oak Hill Road. Uh, where we were projecting a certain number based on the, the land area and density, um, had some existing dwelling units already on it, and thus we were using the gross net increase as opposed to the net. And so um, that did affect the, the numbers and reduce them somewhat. I don't know that it fully accounts for the, the 6%. So I would need to look at that in further uh, to give you a, a more concrete answer. Um, is there a way to to get that up to 15 or or higher? Um, I think we'd need to explore that further. I, I posed that question, I think, to uh, Diana earlier, and I don't know if we had anything that we were uh, considering presenting this evening. I don't it, one one thing would be if the city wanted to uh, identify its own property and require a higher percentage of affordable on it, or not require it, but at least account for it to be a higher percent of, of affordable on it. I think that would be helpful. I also feel like some of the, the loss here was, you know, when we lose um, BART site and we lose to to Silva South, we use lost a lot of units. And so <clears throat> that contributed significantly to the loss of units and are in the buffer. Um, I think that the city could certainly consider uh, redistributing units across its own property uh, to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, identify them as potentially higher uh, number of lower income units, that would be one way to do it. Again, you know, it would not be a requirement that the city sites would be that, but the city could re decide to redistribute those units for the purpose of the inventory to say that its own so it, its own property could be developed at um, lower incomes. Thank you. Follow up on that. Uh, do you know offhand on 949 uh, Moraga Road what we have in there now for uh, low income and very low income? Is that what I would think would be the best candidate? Just asking. Not off the top of my head, but we can look it up. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Vice Mayor Dawson. Just to follow up on on that line of thinking, if we were to do that on city property and kind of reallocate to lower and BLI, uh, would we have to put a program in place behind that to explain that, or do you do is it just you know? I, I'm just curious if that needs to match up. I don't think it would ne necessitate a, a program, but I think we would articulate that in the uh, site inventory data sheets as to why the, the allocation is not the standard green allocation, but uh, a higher percentage of affordable because it's city owned property and we could control um, that through whatever developer the, the city works with to make well, that happen. And, and we're committing in the programs to doing a, 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 a RFP. RFP for that uh, 949 and surrounding properties. It'll be in the narrative. Okay, thanks. Council Member Geringer. So I was gonna save this for timing for comments after, but um, to your point, Mayor and Dury, where we're, uh, we have it in our programs to um, go out for the RFP, but our timeline is much farther out. Would it 
um, not only just increase the buffer, but also strengthen our case with HCD to, to change, pull back the timeline on that. And I know one of the uh, public commenters has also noted that. So we can discuss that later. Greg, I don't know that you have to. It's well, really I guess that if I can put that into a question, uh, is there a reason why I think it's four years out mm -hmm. for the RFP? Is there a reason we picked four years? We're, we're just trying to, of, of the um, many, many programs, yeah. Yeah. We, we just have to try to balance them because we can't do them all at once or yeah. all in the first year. And so right. um, that it's simply that. Okay, understood. Thank you. So uh, I'll save there... it as a comment, Mayor. Okay. Are there other questions? Oh, Councilmember Candell. Sure. So on that same um, thread, there was somebody that put in the argument that didn't HCD in the early days say that we can add the parking lots in you know in front of McCullough's, right? They they said that we could include the parking lots, and I just remember that from about a year ago, probably easily. And so if we added even a little bit more there, we'd probably get over our buffer at 75 per acre because it's such a strong, you know, account. I, oh, let me just put that at 2.4. So if I put 2.5 in there, if I put 2.5 acres in there, we're back, we're 15%. Rather than 2.2 acres there, we put a 2.5 acres there and we're at the 15%. And I, I just picked that one because it's, it's zoned so dense, right? Any A small change there helps. If we argued the same thing went, if we argued that we're gonna get 32 ADUs per year rather than 30, um, we also get to 15%. So I think there's some, even some, there's some other ways we can do little tweaks to get um, back to the 15% if that's a, an issue. Um, but I do have some comments. And one's on the EIR well, well, about just, just just questions for now. Please. Because we'll go to go to the public. Not comment. I don't mean comments. Question. Question. Um, no. Item M1. Uh, that's this the thing about fire impacts. And I know I sent these questions off to Tamala and I was I was just confused. Um, so in it, it says, so it's on page 22 of the EIR, it says. Additional fire facilities are not expected to be required to serve the population as a result of the HEU. And, and I, I question that in, in our conversations with the fire chief about the ladder trucks and with council member Kwok um, going out to looking at sites. And, and the comment was, well, that's not new, but then look back at the fifth cycle EIR and it wasn't in that one. And so it's new for this EIR and just kind of wondering how we justify that we're not gonna need new fire facilities in the EIR. Um, it's my understanding and I'll, and I'll confirm with uh, Deputy Chief McAllister, uh, based on the input and, and feedback from the district that the uh, current number of stations is sufficient to serve the projected growth, the existing community and the projected growth. N not setting aside the, the, the fact that um, one or more of those stations, actually two of those stations, um, warrant seismic upgrade because they, they only one of the stations in Lafayette is up to current seismic standards, um, as well as part of that being able to house a ladder truck. but. Um, so the current closest ladder truck is in Walnut Creek. It will continue to be able to service for the foreseeable future. Um, the fire district is exploring uh, adding another uh, station uh, in Walnut Creek that would be able to house a ladder truck uh, and serve Lafayette. So um, the, the, I think it is, in, in my understanding, and then I'll clarify with the chief, is it's not an expansion of the number of stations and personnel and apparatus that is needed to serve, but rather uh, a modification of, and as I said, two are not, uh, two weren't seismic upgrade and, and um, it, we do need in the next 
10 to 20 years, I'd say, a, a station that can accommodate a, a standard ladder truck. Okay, so I guess my question is why, why isn't that a significant impact, but totally mitigatable, right? And so it gets reduced down to be insignificant or at least, you know, insignificant with medications. What's the justification for not stating it like that, but being able to mitigate it? I guess I would need to talk to the chief uh, and and understand you know the 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 impact on services like fire services and police services is generally a function of the level of service um, and response times and so the not needing additional if the um, let's let's say that we were geographically expanding. Um, and there were insufficient stations to be able to get to those new distant residents uh, in a timely fashion, that would warrant new facilities and could be a potentially significant impact because they wouldn't be able to be served within the, the level of service outlined in the general plan. Um, that's not the case. It's in, in our analysis. Uh, the, the response times would be adequate. Um, but the facilities do need upgrading. Okay. Okay. I have a couple more. Sure. I have a couple more, sorry. Um, so this is just a, a, the in the AFFH, in Appendix D, um, under the regional and local lawsuits. Um, I was wondering who wrote that. And mostly because it's, it's factually pretty incorrect. And the, the, the like they, what they say happened is like factually incorrect. And, and why would we include those first two paragraphs and not include any of the other lawsuits in there? I'm just trying to understand why we have those paragraphs in there. And then we added a bunch of other lawsuits that aren't even in our city, like city of Richmond. That whole new section, I, I guess I just helped me understand why we need it. It's very inflammatory. Um, and why we can, you know, why we have it in there. Can we take it out? Can we take the final paragraph and put it where it should be instead? So the AFFH, we, we don't have expertise on that in-house. It is a, a new, uh, very broad uh, topic and requirement under state housing law. So retained root policy, who has done this for many jurisdictions and has a relationship with HCD to, to gain an understanding of what HCD is looking for. And so I think use that experience to um, craft what, what you're seeing in the draft housing element. Um, ultimately, yes, uh, you have the, we have the ability to modify it, uh, provided that it's accurate and we can be more general in, in nature uh, rather than calling out any one specific lawsuit um, and omitting others. So uh, yes, those options are absolutely open to us. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, uh, oh, and I guess I already got the uh, um, opposite. The only other part was in Appendix G with BART, we've set up to have quarterly meetings starting now. And it just seemed like if we're not including the BART stations, is that one of those tasks that like, wow, that, that seems like a lot now. And, and wouldn't that want to maybe switch more into the later half of the, like in four years from now, start having quarterly meetings with them or something. I just thought that would be something that would be, be pushed back. Yeah. I, um, would they need to start immediately? No. I mean, we, I think we could, wait for some period of time. I, I would not recommend four years because that's that's pushing it out significantly. Um, and what we have learned from BART is that 
just by their nature and um, by the nature of trying to accomplish uh, higher levels of affordability and work with affordable housing developers and just the nature of TOD projects that they take a long time. And thus the, the um, and we, we were, we took the BART sites out and uh, the council so directed in part because of the, the extended time frames for doing a project at BART. Um, so that was our goal in, in putting it in is to maintain this dialogue. It is quarterly and, and it, it, they, there's not a significant amount of staff time that needs to go in preparation for such meetings or as long as we're, we're having an a, um, ongoing dialogue, we're, we're keeping one another informed and can um, kind of path a trajectory, uh, chart a, a trajectory forward. Um, I think we could push it out some, but not, uh, I would, would not recommend four years. Okay, thanks. All right, that was it. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Dawson. I did have a question about BART in the um, housing draft element. We mentioned, you know, obviously we're not taking any, but we're leaving in the opportunity sites. Are uh, eventually, I mean, this is still on the very high fire hazard zone. How, how do we treat that because we're removing it, you know, from this, but later we're saying, yeah, we're gonna include it. We're gonna build on this. Like, how do we allude to the fact that there's a conflict obviously there? So, or, or do we need to? I, I think at every stage we need to acknowledge that it is currently mapped in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Um, th that said, nothing in state law currently prohibits development in very high fire hazard severity zones. However, the AG's guidance understandably uh, disencourages or encourages not doing low density uh, inter where where it's the predominance of the landscape, the existing uh, fuel load persists, but now you're inserting single family homes that are spread out. Uh, what the AG's guidance encourages is higher density concentrated where the, the, the natural landscape is no longer the predominant landscape. It is a manicured designed landscape, if you will that is much easier to manage to the, the fuel load, it's irrigated, et cetera. Um, and the, the state, uh, I think, has advised that sites can be taken out with uh, appropriate kind of rationale. And uh, that's not to say we would, but it, that can be done given that um, arguably it would not have the same characteristics as the greater uh, very high fire hazard severity zone in the topography, in the access, in the fuel load, et cetera. Flat, currently surface parking lots. Um, that it would be a, a highly designed uh, fire resistant project with fire resistive external materials, potentially even exterior uh, sprinklers to, to mitigate an ignition. Um, it's certainly interior. And, and so all of those would factor into any future project and notwithstanding the fact that it's currently, the, the site is mapped. Okay, that makes sense. That actually answers two questions. One, how we kind of get around that later, should that be you know, something we include in, in another cycle? And secondly, why it's not mentioned underneath that BART section anyway, we're, pre we're precluding it because we're just not ready to go that route. So thank you for that, okay. Okay, we'll open for public comments and questions. City Clerk Robbins, is there anyone who has a comment or question? And Mayor Andrew, just to clarify, we're opening the public hearing. We are opening a public hearing and uh, we'll allow anyone to speak for up to three minutes. Our first speaker tonight will be Rob LaVoy, followed by David Clark, Tom Mayhew, and Libby Henry, and Max Enniger. And Cheryl, and everyone raise your hands now, please. Yeah, I, I echo what the city clerk said. It would be very helpful if uh, people did not wait to be the last speaker. Uh, if you want to speak, please raise your hand. 
Mr. LaVoy, we meet again. Welcome. And I'd like to ask uh, permission to uh, combine my wife's time who's here uh, with my comments so I can complete my comments. Okay. <clears throat> um, so this is the most critical decision that you as a council are going to make, I think, regarding this housing. It's either to take a stance on uh, the ADU count and the yields, or to justify to the people of this community why we did a massive upzoning of all eight areas of downtown to make us look like Walnut Creek without a necessity to do that. Um, I'm going to say I'd like to propose that you consider this simple solution. Um, first of all, adding the 2.74 acres, uh, as Colin suggested for the uh, uh, Safeway Shopping Center and so forth, uh, which has the highest, uh, that's the only area that I would propose to uh, upzone. That's zoned at 75, just like the BART. Um, and second, to increase the ADUs, and thank you, uh, Greg, for providing the uh, current information. Uh, I wish I'd had it a couple of days ago. It would have made life easier. Um, but the current data came in higher than my projections, so I'm pleased about that. The final um, applications were 62 versus my uh, calculation of 47. And the final permits issued was uh, 37 versus my calculation of 32. So. The next thing that comes along is the the question of can we not use a predicate or a, a precedent, I'm sorry, um, of your Belinda. It's completely unfair for HCD to arbitrarily say it's okay for H, uh, for your Belinda to use six months of actual applications and then to deny us if we say we're going to use one year, two years, or three years of applications, which I'm going to show you in a minute, actually works. So we can still do what I proposed in my long email earlier today, that we can only upzone one uh, site, which is the Safeway site, and then keep the rest of the sites all at 35 zoning by just increasing the ADU count um, and maybe tweaking the yield a, a touch. But here, here we go. So if we used um, the uh, permit applications, for the current year, 62 times eight, that'd be 496 units. That would give us massive buffers and everything would look good in our model. Um, if we use a two-year average of 55 for eight years, that's 440 units, um, which would also give us plenty of cushion to do everything that I've proposed. If we do a three-year average, which I think is generous because looking backwards on the ADUs is silly. As a financial forecaster, you don't look at historical numbers that are from a different time, you know, like you the, using the Middle Ages to, to calculate how many cars you're going to need next year. Um, but anyway, um, even going back three years and being super conservative on the permit applications, we come up with um, 48 applications, which would give us um, very similar to my number 378. Uh, it's actually 384. And so that would give us a uh, VLI and LI buffer of 20, which is more than the 15 that everyone's worried about. So that's what I would suggest that we go with. However, if the council is unwilling to instruct the consultant and the staff to use that number and the and the uh, uh, comp that we've uh, obtained from uh, your Belinda, we can still make the model work using the current year permits, 37 times eight, which is 296, and put the buffers at 100% for all locations, which gives us a 14% VLI and LI buffer. Or, as Diana just mentioned to Waitai, we could allocate some units from this, the uh, city lot and move them over to make that 14% a little higher. So you have a couple options here, but please, please um, make the right decision here and don't upzone all of downtown when it's not necessary. If we have to down the road, if we're not meeting our goals, we can do that. It's no problem. But let's say we upzone to 75 now, and then we get mandated to upzone later because we're not meeting our goals. What's that going to mean? 75 units with a bonus density is 112 units per acre. That's higher than what we're seeing in Walnut Creek. It's absolutely absurd. And this council should not do that to the city of Lafayette. 
Um, I would also like to support uh, Colin's comment um, <clears throat> about the uh, EIR and Michael Griffith's comment about the affirmatively fair housing, uh, furthering fair housing. And I'd also like to say regarding the desirability of living by the freeway that the 50 Woodbury Court sold for a uh, $1,250 a square foot, which is the highest value in Lafayette, except for Lafayette Circle condo. It's higher than homes in Happy Valley and higher than any other single family home in the community. So if it's such a bad area to put housing, then why are people paying the top, top dollar for that? So anyway, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I've got my model here. I can put in numbers, run some scenarios, answer any questions. Yeah, are there any questions for Mr. Lavoy? Council Member Kendall. So I, I, I was trying your numbers, the 296, the 37, you know, project that out, permitted for eight years, 296. Right. Yeah, you put that in the model and then you'll have to, uh, there's two things you can do. You can either adjust the uh, um, the yields to 100% for both sure. Mount Diablo and non-Mount Diablo, which I think is totally justifiable. All our new right. products are coming in over 100, even on Mount Diablo. And the other thing is Diana just says, suggested that we could take some units from the other buffers, which we have way too many units in those other okay. buffers. Got it. Thank you. The, yeah. Into the A mod. So I'm, I'm following it now. Thank over, you. Easy to get over 14. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay. Mr. Lavoie, thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> David Clark is joining you now. What a great picture. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I um let me see if I can see myself here. Well, that's all right. Um, Mayor Anduri, thank you for thank you for bringing up that the um, fleshing out the additional time you spent on the um, very high fire severity zone. And I, I had a couple of comments about about that, but you you captured most of the, that that discussion captured most of those. But a couple of things. Uh, one is the uh, planning director Wolf said that the if there were a second EIR or an additional project EIR, that the it would be informed by but not bound by. The, the EIR that presumably will be adopted tonight. I want to make sure that I'll just toss this out. That, that we had a lot of discussion about insignificant versus um, significant, but or significant and unavoidable. So presumably EIR number two, we would I would think come to the conclusion that um, that the the danger was significant and unavoidable as opposed to uh, insignificant, so that we would not be bound by, in other words, the insignificant insignificant conclusion. Uh, in EIR number one, but I mean, I, I, that's what I took away from uh, Planning Director Wolf's comments with respect to that. I hope that's accurate. But yeah, another, just, just the mayor's prerogative. Uh, uh, insignificant was never used in the EIR. The finding was less than significant. I'm sorry. Thank you for that correction. Excuse me. Um, there are a couple of other pieces I wanted to add as well, which the. Um, there are a couple of things we can do now. I, I, basically, my comment is I want to make sure that that um, additional project EIR is on someone's radar. <laughs> and Mayor, it sounds like it's on yours, but I, I don't know if that takes a, you know, a to-do list or a, a January 1st, 2020, 24 reminder or whatever, but I'll make sure that's on somebody's radar. Um, they, um, an, another thing, there's something we could not do, and that is we, we don't, Assuming the EIR is submitted, I mean, I'm sorry, the um, housing element is submitted as is, and it's on time. We've got three years to upzone, my understanding. So we don't have to upzone properties um, early so that there could be room for either, I think, switching is what it would be, amending, the, uh, switching possible units through the uh, additional project EIR. So my suggestion is, and it goes to Mr. Lavoie's comment as well a little bit, is that we don't have to upzone right away. Um, I'd keep that in mind too, in terms of how to fit all these pieces together. And I think that's what I wanted to say about that. So thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Clark? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Clark. Tom Mayhew is joining you now to be followed by Libby Henry. Sorry, there we go. Yeah, welcome. Um, thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, Tom Mayhew on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition. Um, we've submitted a letter explaining why we think your housing element is not yet ready. Um, it has math errors in it. It has internal inconsistencies. And But just as importantly, there's substance that's wrong. And I, I'll give you an example to focus you on the law that you have to apply. One of the sites on the inventory is a parcel owned by AT&T. It has a building that's used as a network connection point for the Lafayette phone and internet system. And because the draft claims that the AT&T parcel will help accommodate the need for lower income housing, you have to make as a council a specific finding. You have to decide if you think it's likely that AT&T is going to stop using its network connection building during the next eight years. If you can't make that finding, then this isn't realistic. And I would submit to you that you cannot make that finding because you have no evidence that AT&T is going to stop using its property. And so that, that's 85 units on your inventory and 38 lower income units where you lack the evidence you need in order to certify this housing element. Another example already been talked about is the ADUs. I, I won't go into that. You've already covered it. One more quick example, Desco Plaza. The site inventory overestimates by 38 units because someone mistakenly wrote down 5.93 acres at some point instead of 5.03. So the draft currently overestimates the realistic capacity in a lot of ways. And if you're wrong, you don't have a valid housing element. You currently have a buffer that is too small to protect you from mistakes or criticism. If HCD or a court finds any significant issue with your inventory, your housing element will be thrown out. So what I would suggest is that you hit pause and ask staff to find more sites to add to the inventory. Just increasing the density on the same sites is not realistically going to meet the entire need. You need more sites. You should direct staff to find additional realistic sites for you and to come back with a housing element that has a substantial buffer. That's what will protect you from legal challenge. I know you're very conscious of the upcoming deadline, but it would be better to be late than to be told by HCD or a court that you violated the law. Okay, thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Mayhew? Well, I have a question. You gave two examples. Do you believe there are multiple examples of where uh, the uh, housing element overstates the number of units that can be built? Um, yes, we, we submitted a very detailed letter um, uh, late last week, um, as soon as we got the uh, the updated site inventory, we're seeing a lot of um, mathematical and, and inconsistency type errors. But also, if you actually look at what the existing uses are on the sites, um, there are a number of places where the existing uses. I don't. I don't think that you can make the prediction uh, based on the evidence that you have that those existing uses are likely to stop in the next eight years. And if you if you can't make that prediction and say that it's likely, then you need to um, not count it towards the lower income arena. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Libby Henry is joining you now, followed by Max Henniger.
Ms. Henry, you're, you're muted. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Um, this is very depressing for me. Um, uh, I wrote two letters, um, which I hope that you read. And um, I'm just, I'm like shaking because I'm so upset by the former person's uh, input. Um, I just heard over the weekend about uh, that the attorney general is going to send out, um, uh, I forget what they call them, but you know, it's basically the housing accountability unit uh, where they're policing cities and making their demands. And I happen to think that this person has a lot of nerve talking about uh, being in accordance with the law when HCD has been proven to be outside the law, um, which obviously is not being considered here. Um, but uh, during Greg's report, I, I noted several things that were disturbing. Uh, first of all, the De Silva property is south of Highway 24, so I don't understand why it keeps getting referred to as being part in the high fire severity zone. Um, you know, both De Silva North and South. And as far as this four year average on the ADUs, SB9 was only put uh, into effect of January 1st of last year. So I don't understand, again, you know, it's okay for HCD to be totally inconsistent and totally outside the law and totally outside the constitution of California. But, um, you know, we got, we got the police uh, after us. And um, there was no acknowledgement that we have no control. The city had no control of when builders uh, pull their permits. So we're going to be at the mercy, you know, and I'm wondering why council or staff has not come back to HCD and questioned and you know discussed these issues uh, because they're so important. Um, they just, you know, and it's like they've had months to do this. Um, and. Uh, I'd like to know why um, I, I wrote wrote this down. Um, the 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 whole idea of being not significant. Um, I'm sorry, you know. I'm sorry. Please. There is absolutely no reason, I, I know I'm over time, but uh, my two points, my main points were there's absolutely no law that says, and this is from Greg who said he agreed with me, there's no law that says you have to upzone immediately, um, which is in this HCD. So take that out because otherwise you're inviting uh, builders, you know, wealthy developers. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Our city. Okay. And, you thank know, you very much, Ms. Henry. Thank you. D does anyone have a question for Ms. Henry? Okay. I, I, you I would just start listening to the people. I would just point out um, and, and the Silva, it is south of Highway 24, but it is in a high fire severity zone, the high fi severity zones come over the uh, the freeway. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Henry. Mr. Henniger will be joining you now, followed by Cheryl. Hey, welcome, Mr. Henniger. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. 
Um, overall, this, uh, this draft is a major improvement from the initial draft that was submitted to HCD last summer. Still, I think there's more work to do. Um, Inclusive Lafayette and East Bay for everyone have outlined in previous letters ways that the housing element would have a greater likelihood of being approved. In particular, by concentrating the highest densities along Highway 24, we leave ourselves open for an affordable, for uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing challenge. There's a large body of evidence of air quality being worse by highways. And even with more electric vehicles, this policy will still have a disparate impact on low-income residents. Um, I also, uh, versus spreading it more evenly around downtown, as was noted in the East Bay for Everyone letter. I also want to note that Inclusive Lafayette is in agreement with the many folks in public comment who noted that the community needs more affordable housing. We agree with you. I'll turn your attention to the goals, policies, and programs. First, uh, a clarifying question. It looks like that the waiver of impact fees for 100% affordable projects um, was not in the final draft, despite several uh, council members previously expressing interest in including it as a policy. Um, so why was this taken out and can it be added back in? Um, it would be fiscally responsive, uh, responsible going back to the, um, the beginning of the low income housing tax credit program, which is the backbone for 100% affordable housing finance in the US. So going back to that program's inception in 1985, there have only been two Lafayette projects um, that have gone through. So this, unlike the market rate projects with the inclusionary component, um, we're not looking at waiving impact fees for lots of projects each year. It would be done um, strategically and to support uh, deeply affordable, 100% affordable housing, um, much like the type that we hope that you build on these city-owned sites. So jumping to that point, um, we, we can't su support strongly enough Council Member Geringer's comment on the timeline for publicly owned housing and asking that we move it up. Uh, right now, we're not we're not uh, even going to start drafting the RFP, it looks like, until 2025. I think it was Q2 2029 that we're showing the projects being approved. Keep in mind the affordable housing finance process, it can be another three years to get tax credits. I think, I think maybe it was Greg who noted that Belterra took eight rounds to go to the state for credits. Um, so really, if, if we proceed as we are right now, we're, we're not gonna be opening those units for, for families well into the 2030s. Um, this is probably the single best lever we have to create 100% affordable housing in Lafayette this cycle. And I think it should be prioritized, understanding that there are a lot of constraints on time. And with that, I will turn it back over to the council. Thank you for uh, for all that you're doing. Um, we, we really appreciate your, your leadership um, amidst uh, you know, a, a difficult challenge. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Mr. Henning? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Cheryl will be joining you now, followed by Mike. After Mike, we have only one speaker. Okay, and if anyone else would like to speak, please raise your hand now. Oh, I forgot to unmute. Okay, Ms. McDonald, welcome back. I know, we keep coming back. Um, so I appreciate uh, Council Member Kendall bringing up uh, M.1 in the IR report um, regarding fire services. Um, I first met Deputy Chief Mike McAllister, at, I believe it was a GPAC meeting that was publicly done at the Don Townsend Center. And that's where I first found out that uh, the city of Lafayette was in trouble with a, a fire ladder truck. Um, so I brought it to then Mayor Kandel's attention and, and that's where Deputy Chief McAllister uh, came to the September 27th, I believe, 2021 city council meeting and talked to, and I, that was what I sent you were notes that I was in that meeting. Um, a couple of things that I thought I'd bring up that other people mentioned is why not, why, in that meeting he talked about fire impact fees and he also talked about that we had no place for a ladder truck and that at some point down the road, it's not 10 years, he, he didn't know, he never gave a date of when we would need the ladder truck in Lafayette. There was no date given because it depends on how much development actually happens. And if we get a lot of development more quickly, then that ladder truck is gonna be needed. And what we've currently authorized in this EIR is the north side of the freeway 
is going to be high density, tall, tall buildings. And currently our ladder trucks can only uh, get to two stories. And uh, the more time we spend climbing stairs, the less time we're putting out fires. Um, so I don't understand why that this part was taken out. I think that it should be put back in. And point one should talk about how the facilities are needed in the downtown. A ladder truck is needed in the downtown. Understanding that there'll be delays in getting a, a property and expenses to build it. But it, I don't, Greg will mention 10 years. I, that's no time year, sorry, I'm stuttering. There was no time frame that was given by Deputy Chief Fire um, for length of time of when we would need this ladder truck. So please consider putting this back in. Protect the citizens, protect the citizens moving in the high rises and protect the citizens that live in the downtown area that are near these high rises. Because embers will land on our roofs just like they did from the Oakland Hills fire when they went, embers went over the hills into our Lafayette. So please consider putting it back in. Thank you. Oh, can I add one more brief thing? I do support uh, Rob Lavoie's uh, comments. I think it's a really interesting thing that as a council, you guys should think about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there questions for Ms. McDonald? Okay, thank you very much. Mike from Lafayette will be joining you now, followed by Colin, our very last speaker. Okay, Colin is the last one to have his hand up. That is correct. Thank you. Mike from Lafayette, I've asked you to join as a panelist. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, welcome. Good, Good. thank you very much, uh, Mayor. A couple of things I'd like to add to prior speakers. Um, I know uh, Councillor Cantel brought up the matter of Appendix D and Greg pointed out that it was new, new territory for them. Um, given that, I would encourage caution. Um, and one thing in that regard is to take out all reference to Save Lafayette and the terraces, because that item is still under appeal. So I don't think it's a good idea to reference that in this document going to the state. So just quickly there. Uh, secondly, with regard to Cheryl's comment, I listened to the fire executive when the question of wildfire came up and the question of can you get there in time and his the defense he provided or the explanation he provided for saying he could you know assure you the the audience that would not be a problem was his gut told him i'm not sure if hcd would accept the gut as being a, a scientific analysis so i'd suggest something a little more profound than somebody's gut um, with regard to the general situation, I'm glad that people are pointing out that even though we want to be relatively timely in providing the things required to the state, I think it's also important to understand the context of how others are doing in this regard. For example, of the 538 cities that are required to provide their report to the state, only 29 have currently done so and been accepted, fully accepted. Of those 29, 11 of them actually only have to provide 10 units. And of the total of 29, the average allocation is 207 units. So you can see they're very small. Most of the larger entities, and Lafayette would fall into that category, are taking their time and doing it right rather than just making it headlong to January 31st and maybe getting it wrong. The second point I'd make is a statistician locally wrote an article in the paper pointing out that um, that uh, three criteria that weren't applied to HCD statistics, their allocation numbers, totally wipe out the allocation. And these are bona fide data points. So that's another thing to consider is these numbers are contrived and contrived for a lobby. So. The statistics speak for themselves. HCD, as you know from the audit, has failed. 
And so that's something to consider. And then finally, Builders Remedy has been out there 32 years. An advocate for development said it's a really poor piece of legislation. And he, he hopes that the AG would work with others in the state government to come up with a better product. That's going to be at least a year away to get a better product. But the Builders Remedy, no builder has actually used that approach yet because they know it's a really poor piece of legislation. So don't be scared by that. Take a close look at it, get your legal people involved, and you'll see there are all sorts of gaps in that legislation that really change the playing field for you. You shouldn't be hustled into that. I Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, are there questions for Mr. Griffiths? Thank okay, you. seeing none. Thank you very much. We'll be joined now by Colin. Mr. Elliott, welcome. Um, good evening, everyone. I have my wife here who's going to allocate her three minutes to me. I don't know if I need it, but that's okay with everyone. Yes. Thank you. You can leave. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can stay also. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to start off um, and firstly, um, I did submit an email this morning um, and um, I'd like to thank Greg. It sounds like the, the amendment to the resolution I suggested has been accepted and I think that's a, that's a good thing, so I won't go into that. Um, but I would like to go over, he also then brought up the inventory with some what I call kind of no-brainer suggestions for, the, for some changes which don't really do much at all but make some sense. Um, I'll, maybe if I can bring the map up. Greg, can you share the map of the areas or should I do that? I'm happy to bring it up. Ones that shows that you have areas 1A and 1B and all that kind of stuff. Yep, coming up now. Um, so my sort of, Suggestions and Greg mentioned it, and you can see here was that we can point them out. Um, the areas 1B and 3B, which are planned to be up to 50 dwelling units breaker, have absolutely no opportunity sites in them at all. So it makes no sense to up zone those two areas. They may as well just stay at the 35 units per acre they are currently. Um, I don't see why we would give a value increase to all those properties when none of them are actually in our inventory. Um, the second area I, he, I pointed out and he showed was area four. So you can see that's just the area south of Mount Diablo here. So that's the area that, as I've said in my memo to you, includes some of our you know, most famous properties, Roundup, Postino, La Fiesta Square, Cooperage, et cetera. Um, but it actually only has two opportunity sites in it. So moving that from 35 to 40 literally adds just seven sites, seven properties or seven units rather. Um, it doesn't make sense up zoning all of that, even only by five units per acre, um, just to gain seven units. Um, and Greg showed on the summary that if you took, if you didn't, if you kept it at 35, the actual um, um, percentages or the buffers didn't actually change. It's, it's, it's really a rounding error. Um, so if you keep, I would say keep area of four at 35 units per acre, that matches obviously the areas immediately surrounding it, which is 13. Um, and then obviously area six, those are all at 35 dwelling units per acre and it makes total sense to keep area four at that, it does absolutely nothing. Um, so I'm hoping that Greg showed that. So I'm hoping that in Greg's mind, that was something he, he didn't actually say he agreed with it. Um, so I'm not gonna put him on the spot, but I'm, I'm thinking he probably does, um, that those changes could be made without having any impact. Um, however, what I would then wanna go on is talk about Plaza Center 
um, you know, the Safeway Whole Foods shopping center. And I think um, Council Member Candell touched on this a little bit. So just to keep it in perspective, all that was in before was just Millie's Kitchen, um, which is in the same ownership. That's like 0.9 of an acre, those little parcels there, but none of the rest of the center was. Some of you will know I've been harping on for months and you, if not the whole year about why do we not have any of Plaza Center in our inventory. So I'm very grateful to, to staff for finally putting some in, but I do think they could put more in. So to give you an idea, the whole center is about 11 acres. Um, if you take out the Safeway and it's parking, um, which is in separate ownership, it's not in the same ownership, you're down to, you've got 7.6. So of that 7.6 acres, and that doesn't include Millie's Kitchen, staff have added just 1.32. Um, now, I understand they showed the map and, and showed how they'd kind of come to that. But um, I think as the council member pointed out, and I did go back and I looked in the minutes and it was in the February 15th GPAC meeting where staff actually did study the center based on HCD's feedback of saying, we'll just put in the acreage of the parking areas. And that was about two acres. So you certainly could put in more. You could certainly add at least another acre. Um, I'm quite happy to help staff change the written description to justify that if they need it. Um, but I actually think you could go higher. You could out of us nearly eight acres of land, I'd see no reason why you couldn't put as much as four acres. I mean, you're upzoning this to 75 dwelling units per acre. It makes it a very attractive development site. It's focusing, in my view, our development where it should be, which is on a large shopping center site where we can do a probably a really nice project. Um, and so those people who have been saying, hey, find some more inventory somewhere, I think this is the kind of low hanging fruit for you that you could certainly add at least another acre or anything perhaps up to another three acres to this. Um, and as I said, I'm quite happy to help write that justification if it's needed. So um, that's kind of all I want to say, I think. I'm right on nine seconds, so thank you. If there's any questions, I'll be available. Okay, thank you very much. Are there questions for Mr. Elliott? I can't, could you? Uh, it's way tight, uh, Council Member Kwok. Yeah, please. Uh, thanks for the comments. Uh, just to follow up on your very last comment on that, uh, the Safeway parking lot, 1018 Oak Hill, I guess it shows 2.22 acres currently. And are you suggesting that somehow should be four acres or that there's room for four acres? Um, actually, I think staff originally had 0.91. So the Millie's Kitchen is 0.91. Um, I think you could add four. I think it could be as much as that whole site could be as much as 4.91 acres. Um, but I do think I staff to put that particular slide where it showed the Millie's Kitchen in the light blue and then the dark blue with with the McCulloch's and just if you could put that up as just for us to be looking at while we're talking. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, Yeah, there we go. Um, so one of the things staff had mentioned before, and obviously it's difficult being precise because most of this center is one parcel and then Whole Foods and its parking is a separate parcel. So if you if you break that out and you don't include the banks down the front, you've got about four acres. Um, so that's sort of where I think it's almost exactly a four acre parcel. Um, so you could include all of that, but I, I'm suggesting that we fall back on something that we heard from HCD earlier, which is, well, just include the acreage of the parking areas. Um, so that would be two staff worked out, as I said, about a year ago, that that was about two acres. Um, so there's a number of ways we could write this up and justify it, but clearly this center is going to be a focus of some Pretty interesting, I suspect, um, feasibility and other physical analysis at some point in the next eight years as to actually how you do all this. Um, and I suspect what will end up is nothing that the 
very much like what's there today, other than perhaps the Safeway stays where they are. Um, but this is happening, and I can say this with confidence. I mean, I'm working as a consultant on at least four of these around California, <laughs> where the city is up zone, as you've done, and the owners um, are looking at how they do these kind of redevelopments. And they're centers like this, where they've got tenants right now, but, but these leases all typically are only five years in length, if you exclude the anchors. And so you really can do something quite exciting here. Uh, and I think it's easier to justify more acreage than you've put in right now. Okay, but just to clarify, I think the uh, blue, would we agree that those two blue uh, squares are four, are 2.2 acres? And so you're referring to get to four acres, where, where are you, where's the additional acreage coming from? Is it? Yeah, it's coming from the parking areas, really. Okay. Like the Safeway parking area or? No, not, not the Safeway. The areas in front of, if you like, Whole Foods and the rest of the center there. Okay. So um, there could be more. You're saying that if we upzone the, the parking lot in front of that, that's coming out in yellow here, that could be an additional um, adder, additional upzone opportunity. So Greg's just calculating what that is, right? So it's another... Is that 79,000 square feet, Greg? Yes. Okay. So there we go, a different, an additional 1.8 acres. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you, Mr. Elliott. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Night. Okay, are there, um, uh, City Clerk Robbins, do we have any other hands up for public comment? We do not have any other hands, please. <clears throat> okay, so we'll, um, uh, City Attorney Subramanian, do we close the public hearing? We'll close it, and then depending what action you take tonight, we'll either continue it to a date certain, or we won't need to. Okay, so... All right, so bringing it back to the council. Um, do people, um, well, for comments or, or questions, uh, <clears throat> there are a number of discrete issues we can discuss first, uh, but then we're going to need to go through the entire document uh, to see if there are individual comments on individual pages that we need to address. So we can start with the, I suggest we start with the higher level issues. And the way I look at that is first talking about uh, the ADUs and how we feel about the calculation of the ADUs that's in there now. And then uh, looking at uh, opportunity sites and, um, yeah, and what we might want to do with respect to opportunity sites and how that might impact the zoning level for each of the different areas that we're dealing with. And then if we've made tentative decisions on those, we can go back and, and look through the entire book. But before we do, I just want uh, one, because there was a comment made, or maybe more than one, about the timing and uh, necessity or not, lack of necessity to get this done by January 31st. And um, um, I'm wondering, uh, Greg, if you would like to address that or if Diana, you would like to address that. The deadline to certify is January 31. <laughs> there are certainly jurisdictions which will not meet that despite their best efforts. And some have chosen to go beyond that just because they um, are not able to meet it and, and are comfortable with that. They, they have assessed the risks uh, and don't uh, see them as sufficient impetus to um, move forward more quickly. Um, our, our recommendation is to certify by the 31st so that we can timely submit uh hcd will adopt, have six... adopt not certify oh thank you 
Thank you. Welcome. Words matter. Um, yes. Well, first we certify that's the EAR, then we adopt. <laughs> yes. If, uh, thank you for the clarification. Yes. Uh, adopt by the, the 31st. Um, if we're happy to follow whatever direction the, the council so directs. And if you'd like to take more time um, and uh, have us extend beyond that to address specific issues, we can certainly do that, but we'd recommend adoption by the 31st. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any comment on that? Because we we have been operating under the assumption and it's been what we've discussed that we want to adopt by the 31st, January 31st. And, and it, I just open that. Does anyone want to question that at this point? I don't see anyone who does, so we'll move on. All right. I'd, I'd like to look at the uh, ADUs. And the first question I have <clears throat> on that is that, uh, Diana, you mentioned uh, the way that HCD is looking at it. And, um, you know, it does it does seem, in the words of one of our uh, commenters, that it, it's completely unfair to treat us differently than your Belinda. Uh, but I take it uh, that is the case. And, well, I'm asking you, it, it, do we have any room for uh, maneuver on that particular argument? That there's another city out there that's being treated very differently than we are. Uh, no, I think that the best we can do right now is push for 30. I think that HCD would prefer us to do 20 units for each year on average, but I think that we can make an argument for 30, but I don't think we can go beyond that. There are no jurisdictions in the Bay Area that I know of that have like significantly pushed up their ADUs. I know that San Mateo is in a si similar situation as Lafayette and they've had to dial it back um, basically. And, you know, I don't remember the exact number but they're definitely in the same league as you in terms of saying, we've got X number of units a year, and then we're going to bump it up by five or 10 units a year. But there's nothing that we could really do that would, um, I don't think that we could uh, get any leeway with HCD on something significant like what Mr. LaVoy had suggested. Okay, so what I hear you saying is that we are gonna have a difficult enough time uh, getting them to agree to 30 per year. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have to develop more of an analysis on that. Yeah. Okay. Is there anyone who wants to challenge that? Or are we going to Councilmember Kendall? I, I mean, to me, at San Mateo, they're very different lots than we have here, right? Our city is much more like your Belinda, which is why that was such a nice comparison. Um, San Mateo has a lot of very, very little lots. And so I, I just, I, I, it seems like Okay, the way I look at this, yes, we are going to certify and adopt before January 31st. HCD make, make us come back and do it again, right? And, and I get that. And, and so, you know, taking our current, current run rate of 37 per year and extending that for eight years when we know that that's, I mean, that's lowballing it by anybody's standards, right? Um, even up and get to 35, you know, what can we write a justification with that? Because it makes such a big difference for us. Like, this is where we get all of our units. And so I, I want to try to claw out as many as we can and make that buffer bigger, right? And that it just buys us buffer, which is nice. And for all the right reasons, because we're producing so many. So. Okay, let, let me ask you, we, we've got permits. We, we, and I know, I mean, the other thing that makes no sense to me is uh, that they don't see that there's a change in situation uh, in both the legal environment for ADUs and in the encouragement for ADUs. Uh, and so, and we have a chart that shows a clear ramp up. Um, I mean, I, I would rather put in and let them come back to us, you know, 35 because you know, we've got 37 permits. I mean, we're above the, the number that we're putting in there. And make the argument that, you know, we're on an upslope. We've got in our plans, we're going to do more. And, and we are actually 
you know, I, well, we can talk about the work plan later, but I see ADUs as really something that we're going to be emphasizing. So I, I would not want to <clears throat> see us sell ourselves short on uh, ADUs because we're going to put a lot of effort into it. So I, I would support uh, going for uh, 35. So that would be 280. Um, looking at, I see one nodding head, um, Vice Mayor Dawson. I, I, I could see that. I can see um, because of everything you just stated is supporting that plus, um, you know, I, I know there's, there's also inflation, all this kind of stuff, but we also have a different demographic to, you know, financially as well. So I, I could support that. But how do you just land on that number of 35? Like, do we, do we need to have a, a, um, like a formula for that? Or you're just 35 because we had 37 permits this year? Yeah, because we've already, we've already achieved that in terms of number of, of permits. And we're, we've got the, uh, the, the line yeah. is going up. So you know, I, I think it's it's going to continue up. It might plateau after a few years, but it's going to be going up for the next couple of years. I, I'd be comfortable with that. Council Member Kwok. Well, I think this just raises the question of how aggressive do we want to be with our numbers, right? So we can raise our number to 35 or uh, higher. Uh, I, I talked a little bit about our um, buffer for the very low income and low income being now, you know, below the 14%. Uh, the, uh, if we don't do something, if we don't add more housing stock uh, to try to remedy for that and bring that up, you know, that's that's another bit of aggressiveness. Uh, we could be taking out other properties and being even more aggressive to not, you know, upzone too much. I think the question becomes, um, how like if if we think we're not going to get approved, then you know maybe you bid low, right? And you or you become aggressive because you're not going to get approved. So let's just get the feedback, and then we'll quick we'll be expose ourselves to builders remedy. But then we in the next round you you try to do the adjustments. I mean I think that's sort of one strategy about being very aggressive uh, versus what I, I I think what we've been presented with from staff is you know trying to give something that's very likely to be approved the very first time. Uh, uh, by, you know, being picking numbers or wh wh whatever guidance we've been given, trying to play by the rules. And uh, that might be, yeah, so that I, I think that's sort of just, a, it becomes really a judgment call now of how aggressive you get, and then thereby decreasing your chances of getting a first time approval. Yeah, and the way we'll do this is we'll look at the different elements and we'll come back and see what the package is we have. And I would say just on my part, I do want this approved. Uh, what we submit to be approved. So and maybe we don't submit something that's very, very likely, but I'd like to submit something that's likely uh, to be approved. Thank you. Council Member and, I, and I have a qualified, I, I'm under the understanding that as long as we <clears throat> certify the EIR and adopt a housing element before the 31st, we are protected against the builder's remedy, regardless of whether HCD accepts it approves it at least for like a year or something right is that am i understanding that right we're not getting any exposure yeah council member kendall that is what we would argue if someone sued us we'd have to then defend our housing element and say that we were in substantially compliance with housing element law cool thank you mayor just housekeeping it's almost 11 o'clock you may want to extend the meeting Okay, do we have to, there are several items on here we <clears throat> need to get to lower in the agenda. Uh, when do we need to open those? You, can, you can't start any new item after 12. After 12, okay. Uh, so can I have a motion to extend the meeting until 12? Okay, okay. Uh, motion by Council Member Kwok, seconded by Vice Mayor Dawson. Council Member Kendall? Aye. Council Member Geringer? So I have a question. Does 12, we just have to still make sure that if we're going to try to get to those other items, we take that action at 1150? Yes. Okay, aye. aye. Okay, Vice Mayor Dawson. Oh, Council Member Kwok? Aye. Uh, Vice Mayor Dawson? Aye. 
and I'm an I, so we're extending until uh, 12. Okay, uh, um, Councilman Garinger, I don't think we've heard from you on this. Do you want to make a comment? Um, I <laughs> I have concerns about putting all of our sort of units in the ADU basket, um, but it will support the council um, move forward for the purposes of discussion. Um, <laughs> I, I just think that um, getting all the low and very low, I haven't seen the I haven't seen the data to show that we actually, that it, it works out that way because most of the units that I've looked at that are ADUs that are for rental right now, I would not describe as affordable. Um, and so I, I believe, and also how it still relates to, you know, creating that buffer, we're really looking at the very low and low income. And um, I get the arguments that have been presented, but I don't see the the data for that yet. And it could be that we're too early in our cycle, as others have pointed out. Um, so I, I'm, I think the pushing to 30 um, is fine, but I haven't all along have questioned um, how ADUs actually help us do the whole thing, particularly on the very low and low. So. Okay, I noted. Um, all right. Now I'd like to look at some of the uh, sites. <clears throat> so, the, and the first one uh, is the suggestion uh, that Diana made about allocating accounts from the city uh, property. So, I think you were going to look at uh, what was um, in there for low and very low on the 949 and related properties right now, whether it's a 15% or if it's another percentage. Uh, the allocation for the the city and related properties for 949 is the is the re, the same percentages as the rena allocation which um, on the summary shows as 28 percent very low income 16 percent low income 15 percent moderate and 40 percent above moderate so those percentages, have been used throughout and, and also were applied to the city owned property. Sorry about that. My camera decided to stop. Um, we can redistribute the, uh, the units to those site, that site, that collection of sites if we want to. I don't have uh, a spreadsheet to tell you what that would look like, but we could certainly make those sites because they're city owned sites and designate them as lower income rather than above mod and change the distribution from uh, the arena allocation. Okay, I, I would support that. Uh, I think that if we're going out with an RFP and we've got control over the process that uh, that's something that we would would want to do because that's going to be our opportunity really to control a process. So. So what, what uh, Council Member Kwok? Oh, could you put up the, would it make sense to put up the opportunity to site inventory and point to the ones that you're referring to? Is, to. Thank you. So the RENA allocation is shown in yellow and those are the percentages in L9 through Q9. And so those are the percentages that apply to the uh, site 13 8, which is the city parking lot and some adjacent Methodist Church parking lot. Um, and those are the totals 21, 12, 11, and 30 at those percentages. So we can change the distribution for this uh, to something like 30, 30, and then whatever equals 74. And, you know, make it a decision to like um, identify these as a lower income development site. Okay. Um, 
Councilmember Kwok, do you need the sites up there still? Uh, if we uh, not for the instant, but I I would like to talk about other sites when we do bring it up to talk about other sites. I think it'd be great to have. Yeah, Greg, can you? Uh, okay, I, I hope we can toggle back uh, quickly because yeah. I just like to see everybody as we talk about this. Is everybody in agreement on on that? I guess if we want to get this done, that we've got to agree on specific numbers, at least tentatively agree now. So, Diane, were, were you suggesting an, a, a a percentage or a number? of units 30 30 is that units or percentage percentage but we can definitely work on that to figure out you know some distribution that makes sense okay but when you say that we can work on it that that presupposes then we're going to have a january 30th meeting uh we can decide right now if we if we have a, a, a greg's uh spreadsheet we can say what those numbers are yeah. if you want to we we can apply the percentages in real or, time or number i don't know i i said it as percentages but it, we could also do it as numbers like 30 30 what was it, 74 30 30 and then 10 which is seven seven and then four for above mod that would be my recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I, I don't want to get I know, tons of details here, but I mean, also, this is a great site uh, yeah. for a 100% family uh, low income housing right across from the school near all the facilities. Um, right. But if we do that, <clears throat> uh, and then we decide later, no, we don't want to go out. Um, for 100% affordable, uh, what do we do? Well, I think the most important thing is to plan for, there are two things involved with the housing element is, what are you planning for? Do you have capacity for? And the, the exercise that we're doing right now, when we're talking about this for the inventory, do we have capacity for very low, low and mod? and above mod. Whether that gets built is a different question. And it may be that, you know, if we say a site was going to be identified as primarily a lower income development, we need to make sure that if something else get, gets developed on that site, like for above mod or something, not even housing, that there's still enough capacity in the inventory to accommodate those units that we thought might be there on that site. That's the purpose of the buffer. Okay. So to me, having like redistributing to these um, the lower income categories for this particular site is going to help us with the buffer, actually. Right, right. And even if we didn't develop, at least with what we've got now, we still have a buffer, even if this were to be developed as Correct. an office building. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Well. <sighs> hmm. Okay. All right. Why don't we do this? Let's keep going. because I think we're all in agreement <clears throat> that we're going to reallocate. And it's just a matter of, of what we do. So let's see what we do on other things. So Councilmember Kwok, did you want to address other specific uh, opportunities? Sites? Yes, I did. I had four to look at. There was a mention earlier by a speaker of the AT&T site right. potentially being inappropriate for, to calculate of such a large number. So could staff explain uh, the rationale why we think it's likely or possible that AT&T would accommodate this request? Is it because, you know, Residential can be built around their equipment and they can coexist. Yes, I believe that this uh, site was in the last housing element. And just for, oh, I'm looking on screen as if you're seeing it. Apologies, uh, I will share screen. And you'll see that the bulk of the site is uh, surface parking. Three quarters of it is surface parking. Uh, so hopefully you're seeing an aerial photo. Um, so the sub 
Are you seeing the aerial photo? Yes, yes, we yes. can see the photo. Yes. Okay, for some reason it's not um, highlighting, but oh, there we go. Um, so here, here's the site, and this is a, a long-standing uh, switch uh, center for AT and T. This parking lot has been underutilized for many, many, many years. Uh, formerly, the city actually leased it um, and released those uh, spots for employee parking and, um, for businesses in the downtown. And now our understanding is that the, that's happening, but the city's not involved. Um, and with the, the I, you know, I, I believe that the, you know, move to the cloud and the miniaturization of uh, equipment would allow existing and, and future needs to occupy the same footprint. Uh, it is simply not the case that there are there is a need for this much parking. It's just residual. Um, and so there's adequate capacity on site to do housing. It has there ever been a conversation with AT and T about that? It does look like a, a ideal location and so forth. Is have we ever had a conversation with them? Would they be willing to write a letter to uh, saying they uh, they they would agree to this? I've not had that conversation in, in the last twelve months. Uh, I can invite uh, the former planning group uh, if there were conversations regarding the last cycle, but. Um, I, I've not had that conversation, no, but happy to reach out to at t to see if we can uh, get through to the, the right real estate person. Could help to have a letter just indicating a, a coexistence, right? And a win-win, so potentially situation where we could put the space to better use, still they can continue to operate and we can do more with uh, excellent location. Okay, uh, I just want us to prepare for responses on that one. The second one was um, uh, a speaker mentioned that there was a typo or a miscalculation in 5.93 acres on DESCO versus 5.03. Uh, could uh, could you verify whether or not that's on the opportunity sites inventory for DESCO Plaza 1, 2, and 3? Is that the reference being made and is indeed 5.93 a typo um, that needs to be corrected? I would need a few minutes to be able to answer that. Okay, and I'm I'm not sure if that was the one, but that's the only 5.93 that I could see on the Excel spreadsheet. So uh, it would be good to know if we do have a typo, if we could fix it and what the implications are, right? We don't want to submit yep. it with, with an error. Um, there was an additional um, mention uh, by Mr. Elliott of the opportunities by, of upzoning 1B and 3B to fifth oh. density equals 50 oh yeah no opportunity yeah sorry mayor well can we hold on that uh i'd like to look at specific sites and then come back and look at the uh the areas okay and that's all i had as far as specific sites J just okay. at okay. and desco questions greg do you need time to check or somebody checking that 5.93503 the latter issue Should we wait for you to do that or? Uh, I think I'm being told by my colleague that uh, the, the number is accurate. Accurate, okay. Yeah, but we will quadruple check. Okay, great. But for now we'll operate on the assumption that it's accurate. Okay, now I'd like to go <clears throat> to the uh, uh, Plaza Center uh, issue. I think that's the next most important uh, uh, site and so you know um i guess the question i have is what um asking you greg and you diana what what possibility do you think we have for adding additional acreage there i have concerns uh Primarily that if we are too generous with the number of acres that we will run into 
so a lot of questions regarding um, which we had before about how would you stage it because you'd be removing all this parking. Um, you know, parking is very much an important part of this specific area. And when we came up with the original or the most recent um, number of acres to be included based on the Brazoni letter, et cetera, we had concerns about, um, you know, we can't really take out all of the parking, which is really what would be required in order to accommodate all um, that acreage. And so uh, it could be that in the future that more of the parking could be taken up. And when we originally talked about with HCD, uh, the, you know, this particular site, including Whole Foods and uh, the development between Whole Foods and McCullough's, et cetera, they said, basically, you have to look at the interstitial areas. And so for this development, we uh, have included McCullough's because that's what Brazoni had recommended. And some of the other area to the west of Brazoni's, but not the parking lot in front of um, the, the uh, Whole Foods and so forth because of concerns about Will be there? Will there be enough parking for um, the community? And so that was the decision. We decided to take a more conservative approach to that site. It's possible to include more, but uh, again, this would be a really big lift to explain to HCD why this is reasonable and that it could be developed within the eight years. This is the really the most important thing is I think, you know, if there are if there are parts of the sites that site that could be developed within the within the eight years, that's great, but we can't really say the whole thing can be because it have to be staged and it could probably not be done within eight years to do the whole thing. Okay, Councilmember Kendall. So I remember. Um talking with them and, and we, we'd already, we'd assumed that some of the parking behind on the East Bay, the aqueduct, they said that we could use some of that parking. Do you remember that? The part that's included behind McCullough's, mm -hmm. which is not on the aqueduct, is actually, some of it I think is tiny, but is on the aqueduct. Uh, that's included in the development that we have, um, the development site that we have included. Okay, so so I know Colin said to include the parking lot, but why can't we just include the the building there? I mean, like it's it is, I mean, underutilized because <laughs> only a small strip is actually utilized, and then the back is like empty. We are including the McCullough site, not McCullough, but I'm saying, but the. The part where Noah's bagels is and stuff like that. There's the whole back of that. No, that is. Uh, it, it, I, I don't know if Greg can pull up the site and you can see what's included in that. There's part okay. of the aqueduct behind there, but because he didn't show that in the box, we don't have. At this point in time, we don't have rights to uh, do anything in that aqueduct. So that would take a lot longer of negotiation with East Bay Mud. Absolutely. I, I'm The part that I'm talking about is, so the McCullough, it ends at the end of McCullough's, but McCullough's actually goes beyond that. And it goes that whole back end towards the aqueduct is the back half of that whole shopping center. We are including, I don't know, Greg, if you can highlight everything there that we're including. Right. We cannot include the aqua. There you go. Yes. We I agree that, but, but, you, but you can include the, the back red brick building back there that's the back half. It's still part of McCullough's actually. You're about saying half of that. Yeah. This is to, the, oh, I see. So extend the, the polygon to the east to include the additional square footage. But of all those things, of, I think they're empty. I mean, I think almost oh. all of those are empty. Mm -hmm. No, they're, 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 some are being used 
Some, okay, but actually, not. Actually, most of them are being used actually, at this point on the first floor. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it is two stories, right? Yeah. But that would be a question to Mr. Bazzoni too, right? Mm -hmm. If you would want to include that. Okay. And so just for clarity's sake, the the property to the rear, to the to the north, is the East Bay Mud Aqueduct, right? And a long linear parcel, and we are not including any of that as not. No, okay, I was saying as for parking. There was that we did have talks, remember, with and they said, oh yeah, we could park there, like if we so, needed to. Uh, I think that the conversation was that if the some or all of the the surface parking lot that is on Plaza Shopping Center property is housing is built on it. The where would employees park? Like Whole Foods mm -hmm. did this. They they. Mm -hmm created an off-site employee parking lot to the north. Um, so one option would be to engage East Bay Mud to see if that would be feasible to do on their um, right. aqueduct property, not unlike BART has used uh, East Bay Mud aqueduct right. property for parking to the right. west. Right. Yeah. Okay, just to confirm, what's in the plan, in the opportunity site now is what is in this uh, U-shaped polygon. Yes, the dark blue polygon, U-shaped. Okay. It includes everything from Oak Hill Road over to and including the McCullough's building and the parking lot in front of McCullough's uh, to the south does not include Safeway. Okay, so if it were to be expanded beyond that, where would it, you would be taking parking from in front of um, the, the Noah's Bagels, Pete's, Jamba Juice, C's. Is that right? Is that is that the? Yes, that is what has been recommended by members of the community. Uh, so it's basically, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Count, uh, Vice Mayor Dawson. I was going to ask, uh, following up on, on uh, Councilmember Kendall's question, this I'm, I'm pointing to it with my cursor, but the back building behind Pete's, um, is that something that Mr. Rizzoni just didn't think would be feasible to kind of even consider? Or can we consider it? Because just like McCullough's, which is obviously, you know, uh, a, a going thing, I would think these other buildings were, would be in kind of that same uh, consideration. And, and that does seem, without taking away parking from either the businesses in the front um, or Metro, you know, the restaurant in the front, it, it seems like an opportunity site for housing. Yeah, um, happy to have that uh, more granular conversation with, with Mr. Brizzoni. Um, you know, just from my experience with, with the, the center over the last many years, um, the, the the front building, the south building, which includes Noah's Bagels and Jamba Juice and, and Blue Ginkgo, um, has historically been well uh, occupied and, and frequented, uh, high high use all the way back to the to the back uh, Paseo. The building to the north, to the rear, has had uh, some tenancies, but it's had also a fair number of vacancies and. Um, so I, I agree that of those two buildings, the North building is a much better candidate um, uh, and for redevelopment and could be part of a greater project while leaving the thriving businesses to the South and the parking. And what difference would that make if we included that? Half an acre, just shy of half an acre. Okay, so it's another 30 units. Okay, is there anyone who, um, well, 
while we're, we still have, well, that's okay. The parking, Does it, is there anyone who thinks we should include part of the parking? We should expand into the parking area for opportunity sites. I mean, that's the proposal from the public. Council maybe some, Kerry. maybe some, not all, maybe some. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Dawson. I don't know if we, if we can get consideration for that other half acre, it, it might be, um, I would prefer there the parking. We're already having, we're already looking at parking issues. Um, and as um, Greg mentioned, this is will be phased. So maybe that's something for a, another consideration. I, just to what Diana said about being realistic about you do need parking for these businesses. And even for potentially whatever gets built there. Yeah. Council Member Clark. I'm supportive of the of development of looking into development of these the whole area there. Uh, I think if you the putting it in a parking lot and housing there and then blocking the frontages of you know this major retailers, I'm not sure that that is something you know that the, the Whole Foods would like to be you know they're, they're no longer viewable from the street, right? They're somehow tucked behind there if you're building housing in front, even if the parking was um, maintained. So um, it does. Um, I, I know I would prefer like the idea of uh, putting zoning the back portion, which makes sense to have the housing in the back part, but um, or otherwise the whole thing, but maybe just the front parking lot looks a little, little awkward. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to resist this, but for uh, 19 years I stayed in Houston in a hotel, you know, commuting to Houston for work, uh, across from a big open space. I mean, this is Houston. There's a big one-story parking uh, shopping center. Over the 19 years I was there, they redeveloped the whole thing into a two-story uh, uh, development with more retail and actually a Whole Foods in the corner and parking on second and third floors. You know, so it's you know it's something that can be done. You know, taking the whole block and and uh, increasing the uh, the usage. Um, you know, I, this is not something we're going to be able to talk out tonight, though. I mean, it seems like our, our best bet for now is to see if we can include that additional half acre. Diana. I'm really concerned, and I'm just going to say this once because I know you know this, but we, if if we are going to potentially prevent a builder's remedy issue, we need to adopt by January 31st and send it off to HCD. Obviously, a lot of the concerns that are being raised are super valid. And um, at the same time, I don't know if these are things that are potentially uh, steering people away from uh, considering what really needs to be done in order to adopt the housing element that is in compliance with state law. And I'm just gonna put it out there that, you know, staff has done a remarkable job trying to put together a housing element that will that will potentially meet all the requirements of state law. And um and I just I just have to I'm just concerned that you know a lot of these concerns and issues are really valid. I'm not saying they're not valid, but they're also things that may prevent you from getting to the finish line. That could be, some of them could be developed later in more detail. Um, but I think as considering the number of housing elements that I've been working on, I feel like this housing element, the way the staff has presented it is really going to get you to a point where at least you're going to prevent a builder's remedy issue. So that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Council Member Kendall. I, I totally agree, Diana. And I totally agree that these options ought to be looked at. 
And as long as we get the wording in, even if HCV says, ah, try again, we're still fine with builder's remedy, right? And so I, I, I'm not as concerned. And I think we're close. I mean, I think we're really, really close. We're not arguing about big things anymore, right? I think we're very close. And so, you know, adding in another half acre behind the backside of McCullough's makes total sense. I mean, it doesn't make no, I I think we can do that without even talking to Mr. Brazzoni, right? Just based on what Greg just said about the history of that back of that building. I don't, and we, and all our, all of our shared experiences, it, it could be a better and higher use, especially if we're taking that whole back end and making 75 per acre. It's going to be fabulous. I mean, I think that they're, I think hopefully the Brazonians are going to go for it. If we're arguing about putting in a little bit of a, for the parking lot, no, I think we can spend our time doing something better. But, um, but I think we're close. I think we're very close. Okay. I know you said you would just say it once, but uh, do you see a major issue in uh, adding that half acre that is the, the back building? I do because A, we need something that's written from the owner and then we need to justify why we think the uses that are on that site now will be di could will be discontinued within the next eight years and I don't think we're I don't think we know enough about the site to be able to stay, say that I think Greg does I, I challenge that half of it is already is already McCullough's I, the McCullough's extends into that the McCullough's right. offices are above it I mean it's it's all McCullough's. We just didn't include it. That's how I look at that that half. And it seems but, like a, a right building for mixed use, where you still could have your retail on the bottom and build up. You know, if they wanted, if they chose yeah. to do that, they mm -hmm. chose to do that. It it seems like there is opportunity there. And mm -hmm. but, but I I do ask you. Um, you mentioned we need a letter from the owner. Is, is that necessary in this case? Because it, it has been necessary for others and what would make that different? Yeah, it would be, I mean, the state has said that the gold standard is owner interest. And so I think that even though Mr. Brazzoni and his family has expressed interest, they didn't express interest in this particular site, this particular half acre or whatever it is. And so I I'll would... call them again. <laughs> it's okay. I can, I called them before. Yeah. I, again, we, we didn't um, talk about it that granularly. Um, we do have two letters from Mr. Brazzoni representing that the ownership, um, one from March and one from December um, in support of listing this property as uh, an opportunity site uh, at the 35 dwelling units per acre that was uh, contemplated in March, um, and now at the 75 dwelling units per you, acre. The entire property? Yes, we, it doesn't parse it uh, more finely than that. And so um, what I've said is my knowledge on the, the rear building. Um, so he, he, we did, discuss the McCullough's building and council member Candela is correct that that does extend uh, into that rear building to some degree. Um, so I, I think that we can get clarity from Mr. Brazzoni on that and, and affirmation. Um, okay. And, and even if we can't, if he's out of the country, as I understand, we've got a letter saying he is in favor of the site. And we're saying, well, not the whole site, just, you know, we're just the areas we've indicated. Yes. Which includes this think, extra half acre to what we've done so far. Yeah. I, Mr. I would, I would, seems like that would work. Yeah, Mr. Brazil, I think staff clearly has reservations about um, including the, the front parking lots given yeah. their utility right. to the community and the businesses. Um, the, we did add in the rear parking lot and the McCullough's building based on a subsequent conversation with um, Mr. Brazzoni. Um, and I think the rear building could be included in, and the, the case made for that um, as council member, Vice Mayor Dawson articulated, it would still preserve those front businesses to the south that are the, the um, 
vital businesses and uh, the, the parking. Okay. All right. Now, um, what I'd like to do now is shift to the other items on the agenda, or uh, at least, um, well, the other items on the agenda, and then come back uh, to this discussion and start in with each of the uh, areas, 1A, 1B, and so forth. Um, so, uh, Mala, what do we need to do to just go right to uh, 13? In order to open up the item? Yeah, I'd like to deal with it as quickly as we can, too. So I'm sorry, Mayor, are you asking to put a hold on this? And Yes, can we do that for you know 20 minutes? We, we can. I think we just need to be clear with the public since I think many of the public is here for this item. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do to make sure we uh, get to some of the items we need to do tonight, I'd like to just, I don't know how long it's going to take. I hope it won't be more than 20 minutes. I hope 20 minutes is a max, uh, but cover uh, other items on the agenda. Okay, so uh, we'll go to 13A, and I would encourage council members, unless you have something that we really need to know about. <laughs> okay, seeing none, and the city manager's update? Nothing. Okay. And then we're on to uh, uh, 14. Uh, uh, are there any uh, questions? I think this, these are the great requests we get every year, and we, we approve them, but does anyone have any questions about any of these uh, six items? Okay, uh, then we'll go uh, to public comment. Is there anyone in the public who would like to comment on 14A? And we're gonna take one, two, three, four, five, and six uh, together. So if any members of the public would like to comment on the <laughs> chamber events scheduled for 2023, please raise your hand now. I see no hands raised, Mayor Andrew. Okay, then I'll entertain a motion for approval of resolution 2023-07. Okay, motion from Vice Mayor Dawson, seconded by Mayor Geringer. Uh, are there any comments other than to say, okay. as we always do, how wonderful the Chamber of Commerce is because it's true? Yes. Thank you, Sarah, for hanging in there. I see she's there. So, <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Councilmember Kendall. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Geringer. Aye. Councilmember Clock. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. And I'm an aye. So that's super unanimous. Thank you to Sarah and to the chamber. Uh, we're on to item B, and I would suggest we uh, defer that. Uh, to the February 23rd meeting. Do we need a formal motion on that? Yes, please. Okay, uh, do I have a motion to uh, continue item 14B to the uh, February 13th meeting? So moved. May, uh, motion uh, by Mayor, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Councilor <laughs> Gerringer, I have to, yeah. Uh, and seconded by Vice Mayor Dawson. Uh, any comments or discussion? Okay, Councilmember Candell. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Geringer. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. And I'm an aye. So that's continued. Okay, and then the next two items are uh, uh, receive, well, accept the resignations. And I, I just say, uh, and wait, I'll refer to you on this as well, but Greg, Greg Moronic has been on the environmental task force for years and has done great work. So uh, really appreciate all he's done for the city and his role uh, on, the, on the environmental task force and as chair of the environmental task force. And, uh, and Eric, uh, we're gonna miss him too. He's been a real contributor to the, the meetings. So council member Clark. Absolutely. Uh, both of them have really shown their passion and uh, dedication to making our city more environmentally sustainable. And uh, as you mentioned, Greg Moronic chaired the, the group and uh, really the leadership there. We appreciate all that volunteer time and passion. Now we have two vacancies that we, we welcome the public to uh, apply for these vacancies, but we also thank Greg and Eric for serving so long. Okay. 
So we're back to uh, 11A. And uh, Greg, can you put up, uh, well, wait, I think we know, we probably have it seared into our heads, uh, the chart. Um, I'd like to start with uh, 3B and uh, whether we can uh, move 3B uh, back to 35 per acre. And I have to say where I'm heading, I would, I would like to see us be 35 per acre on both sides of Mount Diablo Boulevard uh, for that stretch uh, between Dolores and uh, First Street. Mayor, were you asking me to put the diagram back? Well, up? I, no, no, that's okay. I think we know, you know, where that is. And if you could uh, tell us uh, and just confirm, we know that we've gotten inf input from the public on that, but uh, how many uh, units we would lose if we move from 50 back to 35, uh, it's just so we know that. And then if there are any policy reasons we should be aware of for not making that change. Uh, yeah, so um, as shown earlier, happy to bring it up as well. Um, there were no no opportunity sites identified in uh, 3B, which is this, um, the north side of the boulevard in the core area, the, the heart of downtown, the pedestrian uh, retail districts, special retail district, um, with, which the downtown street improvement plan calls for the, the paver sidewalks. So really an enhanced um, streetscape experience. Um, staff identified no opportunity sites and through the, the public process as well. In part, I think it's because that that is the uh, main street for the, the community where the retail shopping and pedestrian experience happens. And um, so many of those uses are uh, current and vital and not ripe for redevelopment during this next cycle. Uh, on the south side of the boulevard. Hey, we, but just, just to be clear on, on that site then, if we, th th we would lose no units if we were to revise it. Correct. Okay. And on the south side, it would be a total of seven units because the, there's, uh, I think Mr. Elliott cited three sites um, and and we that is correct it would uh, only change it by seven units okay um, and then and and would you uh, if the count well is there a strong reason not to make that you know to, to keep it at 35. Is, is there a strong By policy reason? reason? I mean, if if you if there's some you know needing to be consistent with what we're doing in other areas, or needing to do something that makes it look to HCD and makes our our housing all more favorable looking to HCD. Because if there isn't, I I think we want to keep it at 35. We want to keep that stretch of Mount Diablo Boulevard at 35 on each side. Yes, the, what the council has has articulated is is a consideration and sensitivity to the the pedestrian experience in the right. in the core of the air uh, the downtown. Um, certainly, stepping up, not exceeding two or three stories at the at the boulevard, and and creating kind of a deep canyon. Um, the we would maintain you know, our our support for increasing the density at the east end and west end. Um, but again, stepping from the boulevard. Um, so I, I, I'm not identifying any uh, issues that, of concern for that narrow strip, the relatively narrow area in the, in the core, um, staying at 35 uh, along the boulevard on the north and the south, um, in part because it, it doesn't material affect the, the arena calculation or our ability to meet those numbers. Um, but further, you know, the, the state has a, a plethora of rules, regulations, mandates around housing and housing production and program, but 
no similar commensurate com uh, programs or, or mandates regarding jobs housing balance or or just jobs in in general and um it's critical for a well operating community to be able to serve those uh, residents. And this is where those goods and services happen in the downtown on the, along the boulevard. And so I think the, the policy considerations uh, be to maintaining it at, at 35 and not upzoning it and having uh, and add uh, unintended or intended consequence of, of businesses being displaced by housing in this narrow core area. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think tentatively we're saying we'd like 3B and 4 to be moved back to 35. Now, uh, does anyone want to ask or consider another one of the areas for a change? Councilmember Kendall. That was one B, same thing. Yeah. There's no opportunity sites there. We're not, I mean, like, would, if we got an opportunity site there, yeah, let's think about it. But since there's no opportunity site there, it doesn't seem, it seems like we should save that for future growth since we're not taking advantage of it now. Okay, Greg, do you want to comment on that? Councilmember Kendall is correct. We don't have any uh, future projected opportunity sites in there. Uh, the the one site which is identified as a pipeline project, it is the Lennar project currently under construction, three stories, 66 units, 15% BMR. Um, and the, the veterans building is in that block as well. Um, a relatively recent uh, office building there as well. So the, the 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 opportunity sites are limited. However, um, it would follow the council's direction to step down from the freeway, which the one A will be seventy five as proposed. Um, so one B would step down to fifty, and then south of the boulevard, the the council currently has uh, area two at 50. So it would maintain that 50 on the north side and the south side. Um, and I don't think that there would be uh, uh, realize a lot of uh, the development that would raise the concerns that the council has been trying to address with the, the uh, shorter heights in the core area. It would also provide parity to that the east end and the west end um, on the north of the boulevard would be similarly situated. So it'd be 75 all the way across um, where the, the additional height can be uh, realized up against the, the height of the freeway, the topography there. Um, the, the shoulders or the east end, west end would be at 50 and the core area that we just discussed would be 35, both on the north and south. So we would continue to recommend 50 in 1B uh, and 5B. And oh, Council Member Kendall. Is there any, are there any sites at all there? Just, just the Lennar site currently. Yeah, we did not identify further sites. So it, it a, a change, a reduction would not materially affect the arena. However, but, it, but from, even yeah. outside of arena, yeah, are there, there any? Are, there, are, there are properties though, right? that could be developed. They're just not opportunity sites. Correct. Well, let's put them in. <laughs> let's put them in then. <laughs> let's upzone it. <laughs> right? I, and I, I mean, they're that's not included answer, because right? they're too small. Is that the? Correct. They're, they're yeah. smaller properties. Okay. So I'll just say that I see a benefit in keeping it at 50 um, because it's, well, it, it, it reinforces the, the argument that we're, 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 providing for more housing on, along most of the downtown. And it gives more justification for keeping our 35 along the core area. 
I mean, and, and we're really differentiating that area and calling for 35 there. I agree with that. And there's parity in that, um, the different ends of town, how we've structured the step down, um, not, not only on both sides, but on the west and the east end. Um, so that. Okay, uh, Council Member Garrett. Um, with Greg's description on um, on even though it has zero or yeah opportunity sites in it right now, um, that opportunity uh, wrong word, but um, leaving it in at the fifty, I would support. Initially, I was if there's not an opportunity site in there, then why are we doing that? But thank you for the description, Greg. Okay, does anyone want to discuss uh, any of the other areas? Okay, if not, uh, here is where we are. Uh, we've tentatively said we want to increase the ADUs uh, from 240 to 280. That gives us 40 more and gives us a few more in the uh, low and very low. Uh, tentatively, we said we want to reallocate uh, the city property at 949 Moraga Road and uh, other properties there. We were going to come back to how we would do that, uh, but that could give us, it uh, would not give us more units, but it would give us more low and very low units. And we've talked about increasing on the Plaza Center, increasing the uh, uh, opportunity site by half an acre, which would give us roughly uh, 30 more units. So we're netting about 70 more units. Uh, we are adding to our very low and low, and uh, we, we are then changing uh, 3B from 50 to 35 and 4 from 40 to 35, and we're only losing uh, seven units when we do that. Councilmember Kendall. We'll confirm that that comes up with a 19% buffer. Oh, so, sorry. You said that you. Do I've been doing this. I've been yeah. I've been doing this in real time, and I think we have a nineteen percent buffer now. So okay. So that's the that's the total on the low and very low. Yeah. How did you allocate the city? Um, yeah. How what did you do on nine forty nine? I, I, I did the 30, 30, 20, 20. Okay. Um, just to be clear, on our nine forty nine parcel, if that's going to be rental, we want to stay at forty nine percent or less, low or very low. Forty nine percent. Okay, so I'll do <laughs> chill down by a little bit. That it won't change these numbers. It won't. It's oh. not a big enough site to make a big deal. Okay, interesting. Um, and what is it? Oh. oh, sorry. Well, what what is it now? I, I can't remember the. What what's the total? So seven, there's 74 units that we think are total there. So if I multiply that by 0.25, that's 18.5. So do 18.5, very low, and 19 low. And then these other ones go up. It'll be 25, 25, 25, 25. Is that okay? Basically. No, it has to be 49, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go 18, 19, 18, 19. All right, so that is still 19% buffer. Okay. But are you trying to hit 74 as the total or you're hitting 100 yeah. the total? I hit 74 as the total. I, oh, I went 25%, percent, 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 percent. Oh, okay. Percent. Okay, so give us those percentages again for what do you, what do you have for very low? 18 units. Oh, well, no, but the percentage. Oh, tw oh no. so 24 points. Well, actually, the units, the, well, let's see. How does that, um, what do we, do we put it in units or in percentage uh, in the uh, description? Units. It's 21, yeah. 12, 11, and 30 equals to 73 units. Sure, and I did 18, 19, 18, 19 across the board to get me just under 49%, right? Well, that's 50%. So plus 19 equals 37. You wouldn't need to take off maybe 18, 18, 18, 19. Okay, I'll do that. I'll take one off. Well, 18. 18. Is, is it 73 units or 74 units? Sorry for me. 74. So oh. 18, 18, 19, 19, 74 yeah. units. Okay, perfect. 
Yeah. So, but originally on, we have 21 units VLI and 12 as it stands now, I guess, with the percentage that we normally have. Not making, we probably don't need to do it, to be perfectly honest. Well, we want to be as much as we want to offer in that. We want to, but with Mala's suggestion, it doesn't mean that we're not going to do it, right? Yeah. It just do we actually put in a housing element like that? It may not be necessary to do it. We may want to do it just because um, of other reasons, but um, I'm not sure it's going to change our numbers that much. Well, I think it's important to you know increase the buffer realistically if we're uh -huh. going to go after pursue policy on this plan too. You know, RFPs for more um, affordable housing there. Absolutely, that is true, and that may be the reason why we do it. Is so, that will be able, and able so why to don't, why don't we do twenty one very low, fifteen low, okay, and then nineteen nineteen. So you said 20, 20 how many how many low? Twenty one very low. So we're we're keeping okay. that we're keeping the number of sure. very low that we already have, and we're just adjusting, and we're then increasing the number of uh, of low of low. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, um, is uh, uh, these five actions? You know, we'll come back to them again after we go through. But are, is everybody happy with making these five changes? I'm looking for nodding heads. We don't need a vote at this point. Okay. All right. So now, what we need to do, unless is there a specific another? Let me check my issue list. And we've done it. Okay, so um, what I suggest now is we go through the housing element and call out specific changes if we have any on pages. And then we come back and we talk about, we confirm these changes and make sure we've got things in final shape. Does that sound like a okay process to people? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna so, do this. I, I would- That's Mary Clark. Are we going to try to vote tonight? I mean, yes. in which case we would ask staff to recrunch the spreadsheet for us while we're going through the long, while we're going through this documents, can somebody recrunch the spreadsheet to show us the final that would be approved? Or is that, is that possible? I mean, basically what you're asking for is the chart. Yes. That shows I mean, we could just say, we, you've just asked us to agree on five things, but- Yes, uh, how, they, how email, are they reflected in the chart? If somebody- I can email could, it, mine what I did to Greg right now, if you want. If somebody could just double check it so that we have, yeah, yeah. these are the five changes, this is how it impacts the chart, and we're voting on this chart, then I don't know if it would be just easier for us. Yeah. Yeah, just then I can make sure the numbers, how the numbers, is it 19% or what that we, 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 we will need that in order to walk away in order to decide tonight. And I need a motion to extend the meeting to one o'clock. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, the motion by Vice Mayor Dawson, seconded by Council Member Kwok. Uh, Council Member Kandel. Aye. Uh, Council Member Geringer. Aye. Uh, Council Member Kwok. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. I'm an I, so we were, we were extended to 1 a.m. Okay, um, Greg, is there somebody who can do that or is that, there's nobody on standby for that? I, we, we can do that. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, we're, we're gonna go through, um, let's see. Okay, we're gonna start with the housing element. This is the pages that have the H numbers on them. And I'm just going to ask you, uh, I'm going to say, does anyone have any comments before page H10? H20? Any, any part of uh, H, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've given my typos to uh, Greg and Diane, and then there weren't many. This was, it was a very good job on this. I don't want to. All right, this is the 56 page document. Uh, that is correct. Okay. Yeah, and just so everyone is aware on page H52, 
uh, in 10.1.12, uh, under summary of inventory, there will be a period after RENA and the words with the upzoning of the BART parking lots will be taken out. Okay, so are we all right? We're okay on the basic document. So now we're on Appendix A. I'm just, I'll just ask. Oh, this, I forgot to put this in my, okay. Um, page A38. Um, down at the bottom of A38, there's something missing. It's a, there's a run-on sentence. It says, in order to address the needs of substandard housing, the city participates in the property assessed clean energy, PACE. Should we just then put a period and say PACE is a financing mechanism? Do you see that on A38? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, does anyone have uh, anything on Appendix A? Going once. Appendix B. Um, no, on Appendix B, the only thing I, I discussed with Greg, uh, we were talking about the multifamily housing and why they are where they are. Um, we mentioned civic services and 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 retail and all that, but we don't mention schools when the downtown is walking distance to an outstanding elementary school and outstanding middle school. So K to eight. Um, did you have a chance to do anything with that, Greg? Or we? No, but if the council so directs, we can add that clause to references. Okay. How, how do people feel about that? I, I'm just trying to, I mean, we, we have the people saying that yeah, there's some, well, I, I mean, you saw the letter that said there's, it's a substandard school that's in near the downtown and it's just ridiculous. So, okay. Yeah. I, I, so I think it's it's worthwhile putting it, pointing out that this housing is going to be near. Yes walking distance to K to eight schools. That's a fantastic. I mean, they just got distinguished and they get the distinguished yes. award this year. Yes, the, the gentleman who wrote the letter didn't come on to make a comment tonight, but I was going to ask him about that. Did, did he realize that in the last two weeks, the school he's referring to received yep. the outstanding school award and the school in my neighborhood didn't get it. So, yep. anyway, and your neighborhood too. Um, Appendix C, any changes there? I reported this to Greg already, but there are a couple error reference source not found um, yep. errors, which I'm sure will be cleaned up. Yep, got that. Yep, we'll pull those back in from the prior draft. Thank you. Okay, Appendix D. Um, that was okay. one where they now, talked I, about I, the lawsuits. Yeah, yeah. And Appendix D, I, I just want to preempt you. I, I would like to take out any references to NIMBYism, YIMBYism. And uh, I think the paragraph, the second paragraph, the first full paragraph on D19 can be struck. Mm -hmm. The one that starts, though Save Lafayette lost their lawsuits. I'm not sure that paragraph adds anything to what we're trying to convey. And, and the prior paragraph is, is actually incorrect. It's factually incorrect on a couple different levels. So not sure. And also, I mean, like they said, that we said that we approved the project. It's like, well, we didn't <laughs> in 2015. It's like, there's just a bunch of stuff in there that that people, that was just wrong. So yeah. um, I'd like to strike both of those. And then the third one too, because it's talking about it, or the fourth one too, because it's a, or the third one, because it's talking about a lawsuit in, in, against the city of Richmond. Not even Lafayette. Yeah, could we jump just into well, that? Well, that, that's in there because there is a requirement in AFF, AFFH to talk about 
issues pertaining to other jurisdictions within the, the community, broadly spoken, which includes the county. So oh, a lot of other jurisdictions. Oh, okay. so we have to include that. I think okay. it's fine. We can edit the, the, as you suggest, we can edit the section as you've requested, but I would leave in the stuff about Richmond because it talks about the county generally. Okay, that's- Okay, so can we say that uh, uh, you, you will edit the first paragraph, we'll delete the second paragraph. Um, and let's see, I, I'm trying to, I don't think there were other references. Is that, is that satisfactory to, to everyone? Okay. Yes. All right. Anything else in? Oh, uh, okay. Greg and I talked about that. That's okay. Uh, in B, in D. Sorry, D. Okay. We're on to E. And uh, I don't think we have any. I doubt there's anything on E. So then to F, and I don't think anyone's going to have anything on F. So we're now on G, the programs. Okay, does anyone have any changes? Oh, Greg, I, I think I, for, I can't remember if I put it in my email or not, but on, it's, it must be the fourth page. 4.1.B, is that meant to be deleted? This is Appendix G? Yes. Uh, we'll check. Okay, uh, Councilmember Garage. Um, I think this is the section where when we were talking um, several hours ago in the meeting about moving up the um, on 6-1-G. Um, and maybe I jumped ahead too many elements, but that's the one on the um, actually moving up the timeline uh, for mm -hmm. putting out the RFP. Um, and particularly since we're talking about trying to increase that on publicly owned our, our properties, I think that um, to actually put sort of teeth behind that. Um, and Diana's coming on to, to say something, but <laughs> anyway, I think this is where the policy decision around or the, yeah, the decision on the part of the council to potentially move that up. Yeah, that was something that HCD specifically asked us to do. To uh, move something up? To, to yeah. leave, I mean, where it, where it is now or to make it even sooner? Well, I think that where it is now is okay, but I, if, you know, we, I, I think we originally talked about it later in the cycle. And so yeah. this has been moved up. So okay. if you wanted to move it up more, that'd be even better, but we just wanted to make sure you knew that this is what we were proposing. Okay. Yeah, I see that it's redlined. Uh, sorry, Mayor. Oh, go ahead. No, I see that it's redlined, but I, I do think that, um, this is one area where we talk about affordable housing and trying to provide uh, more affordable housing in our community. And for all the reasons that members of the public and that I think a couple of us tonight have said that this is an area where we can actually make that commitment, both in the allocations that um, Mayor Andura, you had, had us walk through earlier, but then also here in the actual implementation of trying to move it forward, knowing it has the long runways and all of those things. So um, I would like us to, and I'm looking at, you know, starting it where you have it starting in 2026. I mean, even, you know, earlier than that, 20. And I know there are all kinds of other things going on as well, but um, moving us forward to potentially even next year or 2025, so. Well, you know, what it is now, it, it is starting in 20, quarter one, 2025, so two years from now. Um, yeah, but, I would even, yeah. I mean, I, the, please, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I would, I would recommend 
that this this be moved up to you know be a higher priority than some of the others and i apologize i don't have a where you know what thing could be bounced could be pushed out yeah. um, to do this but um open to discussion on that but definitely wanted to have the discussion on that ah <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at, through this also from the lens, you know, what we're going to be spending time on. I know downtown. So we, we don't we don't know now what's happening for sure with the plaza properties. You know, when we get some clarity on property purchases, you know, we'll have a better sense of where we're going to have to spend time. And I'm concerned that there's going to be at least over the next year a lot of time. Because we we promised a lot of public input on that, and we'll deliver on that promise. So you know that's going to take time. Um, as much as I would like to move that to starting first quarter, and these are calendar quarters, right? Qu quarter one, twenty twenty four. I'm just a little bit nervous, you know. But if, if people want to. Do With that. I'm, I'm Council Member Kendall. I, I I was proposing we push the Bart stuff out. Let's take the heat off of us. You know, push the other one first, and then I know I don't know if that would help. I'm just saying that might help. Okay, Council Member Garinger. Well, I, I was writing all my notes for this section apparently, but um, but we directed staff to begin discussing continue not begin because we were already talking to bart and i um believe that staff as greg pointed out that it's not um like a high intensive time but we directed to look at that um when we were making the decision to pull bart out because because it wasn't going to happen for all the different reasons but because it wasn't realistic that it would happen in the eight-year cycle that we wanted to begin um, looking at that sooner. So I get the pressure. <laughs> I mean, I, I like, I want both of those to, you know, be moving forward. I know we have the downtown uh, specific plan, but with the way that this, I mean, we just pushed this right up until the very end to being able to have that, you know, great opportunity for that um, low and very low housing in the school. So yeah. Um, and I'm looking at all the breakdown and thank you to staff for moving it, you know, for, for putting something that put a priority on it. Okay. Um, so the, the 2026 is in a column that's headed completion, completion timeframe. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. But the description does go out beyond well the 2026 is getting the rfp done right in that one analyzing the feasibility of proposals by the yeah. end of 2026 so you're having the proposals and not really doing anything until 2027 <laughs> or later in that 2026 so you're making recommendations and to for projects and proposals so for affordable housing um proposals. So anyway, I don't I, I don't necessarily want to belabor it, but I do think it's one of those areas where um, we could actually, we talk about affordable housing a lot, and we talk about um, trying to do these things. And I think it also um, helps us in the area of removing barriers and constraints. So Okay, uh, it, it right. I'll, I'll, I'll support changing the column from 2026 to 2025 and then changing the column on the right to quarter one, 2024. Uh, but I want to give Greg a chance to weigh in. I, I was looking at the Gantt chart um, and thus I would, I think we can accommodate that by pushing out uh, program 61c which is updating the inclusionary housing ordinance um to my knowledge mm -hmm. the, there's nothing mandating or compelling that in the shorter time frame and i understand the council's desire to prioritize the the rfp because this could realize actual uh, additional units in the near term and it's and its city controlled property so 
Um, I question, think, question. Is that delaying the nexus? That's what it's saying. Uh, no. The, the, okay, we'll keep the nexus. That's 1.2.a. Yeah. That, that okay, good. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, okay, then I support that. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Dawson, Council Mayor Quack, are you okay with that? Yeah, that, that okay. sounds like as long as, um, you know, Greg's on board with that and what, what he, you know, that was a great uh, trade off. Okay, great. All right. And uh, let's see. Where will, Greg, were you looking something up on a prior? Oh, you were going to 41B. What's, is that meant to be deleted? Uh, yes, it, uh, in okay. scrutinizing it, it, it is not a program that we identified that would actually produce uh, units. And yeah. so given the other priorities to focus on programs that would produce units or realize units, um, that was scratch. Okay, great. Okay, any other comments on the uh, programs? About 10.3B on BART. I, maybe yeah, I now this up. Greg and I have talked about that. Greg, do you want to talk about the changes, proposed changes there? I guess that would be this, what I highlighted in yellow, it's sort of a sentence mm -hmm. fragment. The city will continue to take actions necessary to ensure. Is yeah, it, it's an incomplete sentence. Maybe. Greg, have you had a chance take to- Take actions, period. These actions include. I've, I've not had a chance to revise that. So I, I think, uh, uh, Councilmember Kwok, we were going to put something in there about continue. Well, that we would be working on a a a, a, a BART or a transit oriented development overlay district. Okay, so for this this box here, yeah. Yeah, the, the first bullet, I think, is no longer applicable, proactively upzoning mm -hmm. the sites right. to 75, dwelling in his breaker, pursuant to 2923, um, it's effectively zoned that, uh, as, as are the development standards requiring the city to allow five stories in height. Um, but the, the remainder of the bullet, bullet two and three, Mm -hmm. Well, bullet one we would replace by saying we'd be working on the tr transit orient development overlay district as part of the the downtown specific plan update, or separate. No, no, it's a separate overlay district. And you you want to include that as the first bullet? Mm, that, that's pretty specific, Carl. You know, don't you think? Uh, I mean, unless we are saying we're going to have that done. In that time frame, because if we are, it depends, right, on the DSP. Um, could it be a part of the DSP, even though it's a separate plan? Could it be a? Mm -hmm. So can we just say we're working on a downtown specific plan, part of which will be a overlay for transit-oriented development? Yeah, or I might not even take that form. Honestly, I think that the the, the scrutiny of the plan. Um, and the expansion of the, the geographic boundaries to include the full length of the, of the boulevard right, right, right. and to extending north to include the bar parking lots. Um, I, I, I think that it's a specific plan that looks at land use, transportation, and, and the like, um, and development standards, et cetera. So, I think rolling it into that effort and not having a separate effort is probably the the best path. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm 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 not so sure about that. Okay. Uh, I'd rather leave that um, decision for a time we can really discuss it. Okay. Um, so I guess if we can, I, I think we want to leave something in here that indicates that we are going to be working toward uh, development of the BART site. Uh, so just a general statement that that's, we'll continue to talk to Bart. Maybe that's all we need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I think we can strike the first bullet and, and leave the remaining. Okay, but we, you, you need a complete sentence in the first, in yes. the intro. Okay. All right. Anything else on uh, G? Okay, seeing none, I think then we go to... Okay, well, the, the opportunity site inventory would need to be updated as we discussed. 
So I don't know if we need to talk about that any further. So in terms of the housing element, I think the only thing to do now is to look at the updated chart to make sure we're comfortable with that. And then if we are, then we, we need to look at the uh, uh, the EI, look at the resolutions. So do we have the chart? Wow, great. And so um, coming back, answering an earlier question from the council with respect to DESCO, uh, it does look like the, the, uh, there was a, a du erroneous duplication of one of the parcel sizes. And so we we're, would we're, reduce it down uh, consist as recommended by the speaker. Um, so I'm gonna bring this up on screen. So the yellow highlights are the, the changes. So uh, row 12, site 25, that's the one I just mentioned. Um, what was the total before? It says 225 now, what was it before? Two sixty five. So minus forty. Okay, that offsets the ADUs. Yep. And it takes out um, how many? Uh, how many of the very low and low did we lose? We're still at a seventeen percent, I think. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thanks for double checking that, and uh, to Colin yeah, for, for uh, I guess the speaker for yeah. Mr. Mayhew. So the uh, changing density in area four to thirty-five dwelling units per acre. We need to up the number in McCullough's and add a half an acre, right? Yes. I think it was 2.22, no, it's 2.7. So that's half I an said 2.75. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need every little. Yeah. And then the city owned parcel reallocating those at 25% in each income category. Yeah, we, no. had, we had precise numbers. Okay. Yep. So 21. 20. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, you have it. Yeah, go ahead. So tw 21, 15, 19, 19. Thank you. So the summary gets us to 17% buffer for be a low, very low income and low income. Okay, and so, wait, so scatter, okay, dwelling units, got it, 2086. Yes, okay, does any, anyone have any questions on that? Is any, everyone uh, comfortable with this? Could you show us 3B again and 3B being uh, going back from 50 to 35? 3B, okay. Um, that's row 24, if you went a little. Is that, what happened to, well. Is there zero? What happened to the number three B, which was in column D? Or let's see. C. 
I, I, I guess you're missing column C. You're not showing us column C, right? It somehow got lost. Yeah, it's hidden. It's yeah, and I. Oh, you have to go to A, go to A, and then unhide them. Come on, you have to highlight A and D. A and D. Here we go. Uh, okay, yeah, three B is now thirty-five. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, is everybody, I scroll down on the pictures here. Is everybody okay with with this? Yeah. Got it. It's 280. 2886. Okay. Um, okay. Then uh, we I will assume that uh, people are going to vote yes on the resolution. Uh, so we, let's go on to the uh, EIR, which we have to do first. <clears throat> okay, so we have 85 pages of uh, resolution number 2023-24. And does uh, anyone have comments or questions? I think if if Greg could just put up as amended the two whereases, just so that we know what we're voting on. And uh, I'm sorry, which 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 uh, resolution are we looking at right now? Twenty twenty three twenty four for the certif certifying the uh, yeah. final EIR. Okay, great, thank you. And making findings. Mayor, City Clerk Robbins here. I, is that 2023-04? Yes. Correct. Not 24, but 04? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, 2023-04, sorry about that. No problem. What am I doing? Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Bringing up the resolution red lines now. You see in the slide titled Resolution 2023-04. Mayor, are you seeing the? Yes, I'm seeing it, sorry. Yeah, no, very good. Uh, so this is the proposed revision uh, proposed by Colin Elliott, which uh, staff supports and thus the revised resolution would be include the red lines. Was there an additional slide or was that a different resolution? The, it, was, it was a change in the EIR. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's so part of this document, right? Perfect. Perfect. Well, Thank you. This resolution certifies that document. And uh, the EIR is an attachment to the resolution, so. Yes. This would add that additional clause uh, underlined to page one six of the final EIR with minor mods.
Okay, so any questions or comments on the on resolution 2023-04? Okay, then I'm gonna ask for a motion um, to adopt resolution number 2023-04, uh, certifying the final environmental impact report and so on. So moved. Okay. So adopt resolution number 2023-04 with the modifications suggested by our city planner. Uh, second. Okay, so um, moved by Councilmember Candell, seconded by Councilmember Geringer. Is there any discussion before we vote? Seeing none, Councilmember Candell. Aye. Councilmember Geringer. Aye. Councilmember Kwok. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. And I'm an aye. So it's unanimous. The EIR is certified. So now we move on to resolution 2023-05. Resolution adopting the housing element update. And uh, that would be we would be adopting this with the understanding that all of the changes that we have discussed tonight are going to be incorporated and we are adopting it as, as re revised this evening. So any uh, comments or questions about the form of the resolution? Do I have a motion? Vice Mayor Dawson, do I have a second? Council Member Kwok, is there any discussion? Council Member Kandel. Regretfully, I'm gonna vote no. I preferred our first housing element submission. I supported that. Um, I, 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 I think we could have done a better job on this one and, and gotten more sites and not have to upzone as much. So unfortunately, I'm gonna vote no. Council Member Geringer. Aye. Council Member Kwok. Aye. Vice Mayor Dawson. Aye. I'm an aye, so it's four to one. The resolution is adopted, and I want to thank Greg and your team, Diana, for all the work that you put in on this. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing amount of work. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll just remind everybody who mentioned Beltaire, Diana was our Diana was our consultant on that as well. So um, really appreciate all that you've done here and Greg and your team again, just uh, great work. So thanks to Renata. Uh, all right, um, that brings us to the end of our business for this evening. Uh, Mala, do you have anything we should be doing? We. I think we no longer need the, um, we'll have the special meeting set for next Monday just to discuss um, the potential ac acquisition of the police station property. Yes, that's the only item on the agenda as of now. Uh, Vice Mayor Dawson. I was just gonna ask a question, what, when this is finalized, I uh, imagine we will, how will we get a copy, so, you know, or will that, will, will that be available with all the changes, all the materials? Yes, we will uh, post it on the city's website. We will convey it electronically to HCD and physically to HCD. And we'll, elect, we'll let you know when it's up. Councilmember Garinger, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, and actually one of the people left, but as we were thinking um, staff and consultants, I wanted to thank Mala and uh, BBK for their advice along the way, and also um, just acknowledge the GPAC. This has been in planning commission. So I listened to the planning commission meeting from January 3rd. And anyway, just a lot of effort and the members of the public who have spent so much time and energy um, making sure that that we got it um, as close to, you know, representing everyone as we could. So I just wanted yep. to I, I would start thanking members of the public, but I know I would leave somebody out. So I do appreciate all the work, particularly the work in the last 
few days on this. And, and Mal, please, if Sarah is no longer on, please convey our our thanks to to her. Yeah, and thanks I, for the people on your, online right now. I see, and you know, welcome Sonia. Thank you for sticking, you know, <laughs> through, on this first meeting and and seeing this through. Hmm. All right, and thanks to each of you for all your work on this, uh, my fellow council members. It's it's been a long, a long consideration, but thank you, thank you for all the thought you put into this. Okay, and we'll we'll meet just again. Just one in a week. more, really, really fast. I don't want to drag it out one one more minute, but just thirty more seconds. Uh, Mayor Andouri, it was you ran a very tight, great mm -hmm. meeting and summarizing everything tonight and keeping us uh, moving forward. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And then I'm done. Yes, <laughs> agreed. Cheers. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you, and we'll see you next Monday, if not before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank the you. The meeting is adjourned.